Make sure it's good. Don't screw this up. Greetings, my lovely randos. The time has finally come to dive back into the Hobbit trilogy one final time to work out exactly what parts are most deserving of praise or criticism, give conclusive thoughts on the various characters and plot threads present within the trilogy, and have a bit of a discussion on adaptations, unreliable narrators, and the various storytelling shortcomings present within. I am also going to talk about some of what I consider to be storytelling fundamentals, although I will try not to repeat too much of what I covered in the Rings of Power final autopsy video, as the reasons why Rings of Power is not very good are very different to the reasons why The Hobbit is not very good. The format for this video is going to be similar to my final autopsy of Rings of Power, however just in case you have not seen that video I will clarify. You should be able to watch this video and only this video in order to get an overview of my thoughts on The Hobbit trilogy. However, if you would like full context for everything I am about to cover, I would suggest checking out my previous three videos in this series, totaling over nine hours, where I look at each film independently, as I am not going to be providing full references for everything I am about to say. Additionally, I am analysing the films, not the books. I may make passing reference to Tolkien's lore, but I am by no means using lore adherence, or lack of, as any kind of metric for assessing quality, or lack of. With that out of the way, I would like to begin by retracting some points of criticism from my previous videos in this series where I either made a mistake, or, as some of you guys pointed out, where my conclusions were simply false for various reasons. In part one, my comments on Thorin's survival chances when being wailed on by Azog whilst holding a tree branch were unreasonable. A tree branch as large as this would, in fact, provide some amount of protection as it would compress and therefore absorb much of the impact from Azog's mace. Additionally, dwarves in Middle-earth are tougher and more resilient than men, so I have no issue with Thorin being able to survive this. In part two, I criticize the dwarves not using the front door of Erebor, as their entire plan hinges upon their ability to enter via a secret passage. As we see in the film, when Smaug leaves to destroy Lake Town, the entrance has been barricaded, presumably by the dwarves after they evacuated, and Barlin explicitly states in an unexpected journey, You forget, the front gate is sealed. This means that, yes, they feasibly could have dug their way in through the rubble to enter via the front gate, which would then eliminate the need for the map or the key. However, had they done this, it is not unlikely that they would have woken Smaug. Because the films are not clear as to what the dwarves considered Smaug's status to be at this point, plus the fact that none of them at any point even acknowledged the possibility of entering via the front gate, it is difficult to pinpoint exactly what should have happened here. My suggestion would be that instead of giving up when they are unable to enter via the secret passage, they instead state their intention to head to the front gate and attempt to dig their way in. This would then allow for the writers to explain that whilst this is possible, the dwarves consider it to be extremely risky due to the risk of waking Smaug, which would then make clear exactly why they spent so much time and effort working out how to use the map and key. Bilbo could then call for them to return, as he does in the film, meaning that they would not actually attempt to break their way in the front door. In part three, my claims about Galadriel's use of telepathy were slightly inaccurate, as I hadn't accounted for the scene in The Two Towers where she speaks to Elrond, who is in Rivendell, whilst she is in Lothlorien. I also inadvertently exaggerated how far Lothlorien is from Dol Guldur. Lothlorien is not on the other side of Middle-earth. It is still around 100 miles away, meaning that the timely arrival of the White Council is still impeccable, in particular with regard to Saruman, Radagast, and Elrond. This, plus the fact that Galadriel, Elrond, and Gandalf all appear to be able to communicate telepathically with each other means that, yes, what we see happen will have been possible, just incredibly lucky. Additionally, I criticised Dane changing his mind off-screen as to whether or not to help Thorin. However, Dane could well have heard Thorin's plea for help via the bird, and thought to himself, holy shit, he actually managed to take Erebor. I guess I should probably go see what's going down, because no doubt other people will want some of that juicy gold. Whilst this explains why Dane may have responded to Thorin's summon, it does not fix the problem with regard to how Dane managed to arrive anywhere near as quickly as he did. I also made a slight error with my criticism of the Mithril plot point in part three. I am aware that the book explains why there was only one Mithril shirt in Erebor, but as the film does not, this raises the question as to why the shirt Thorin gave Bilbo was the only one, as with no explanation this does not seem at all reasonable. However, given that there was only one, and given that it was the right size for Bilbo for reasons that are again explained in the book but not in the film, 
This means that Thorin's decision to give it to Bilbo does make sense, provided we don't question why Thorin is giving Bilbo something unbelievably valuable without realizing. Finally, there are also a couple of additional points of criticism that I missed that have since been pointed out to me. One point that I missed with regard to distance and time is that Legolas and Tariel were able to travel from Lake Town to Gundabad and back again, seemingly in a day or two, which is simply impossible. And finally, the orcs and trolls fight in daylight in the Battle of the Five Armies without any adverse effects, which is at odds with the trolls scene in An Unexpected Journey as well as a deleted scene from Return of the King. The orcs of Mordor have no love of daylight, so he covers the face of the sun. Maybe Gandalf was specifically talking about the Orcs of Mordor here, but either way, this is probably something that should have been at least addressed. And with those corrections out of the way, let us continue with a discussion about canonicity. As you may well be aware, the relationship between The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings films is not at all the same as the relationship between Rings of Power and either of the Peter Jackson trilogies. Rings of Power was set in a totally different interpretation of Middle-earth, and it does not directly connect to the Peter Jackson movies for a variety of reasons. Rings of Power is set thousands of years prior, and it is produced by Amazon and not Warner Brothers, and the rights Amazon has to adapt Tolkien's work are not the same rights Warner Brothers had. Rings of Power can theoretically do whatever it wants, and it will not negatively affect the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit trilogies, because it is not narratively connected to either of them. There is no direct continuity between the two, and therefore Amazon's Middle-earth and Peter Jackson's Middle-earth are not canonical with each other. Therefore, if Rings of Power completely annihilates the character of Gandalf, this does not affect the Peter Jackson films in the slightest. However, unlike Rings of Power, the Hobbit trilogy is a direct canonical prequel to The Lord of the Rings. Written and directed by the same people, produced by the same company, featuring many of the same actors and characters, directly linking itself in with The Lord of the Rings at multiple points, and being an adaptation of the prior book in the series. If The Hobbit completely annihilates the character of Gandalf, this quite unfortunately does negatively affect The Lord of the Rings, because The Hobbit's version of Gandalf is the same character. The canonical link between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings is both a blessing and a curse. It can potentially allow for an expansion of the setting and a deepening of some plot points or characters that appear in both. However, if anything goes catastrophically wrong, then it will inevitably detract from The Lord of the Rings which then makes those flaws with The Hobbit that much more egregious. Quite unfortunately, there is a lot in The Hobbit that does precisely that. It damages The Lord of the Rings through its insistence on goofiness and overcomplicating what is ostensibly a very simple story. The viewer can, of course, choose to put The Hobbit trilogy out of their minds when they watch The Lord of the Rings, which is precisely what I do, as the Lord of the Rings trilogy is better if the Hobbit trilogy doesn't exist. And whilst I think that is a totally valid and reasonable mindset to have, it does not address the core problem as it relates to the Hobbit trilogy. The Hobbit damages both itself and the Lord of the Rings by being connected to the Lord of the Rings. First up, the ending of the trilogy ruins what could well have been an emotionally effective and poignant narrative beat by shoehorning in some sweet, sweet nostalgia, which actively damages the ending of The Hobbit. Additionally, we learn in this trilogy that Sauron really, really wants Erebor, but Erebor is never even mentioned in The Lord of the Rings despite Gandalf being fully aware of Sauron's previous intentions. We also see that Bilbo is being corrupted to some degree by the Ring after only a few weeks, or months at most, and yet he seems to be doing alright 60 years later. We also have the rather critical flaw that comes about entirely as a result of the Necromancer subplot. The White Council fought Sauron and the Nazgul 60 years prior to Fellowship of the Ring, and yet they evidently did nothing after yeeting him into Mordor. No one was ready for Sauron's return, despite the fact that Gandalf, Galadriel, and Elrond all knew that he had returned. Gondor was not warned. There was evidently no attempt at preempting the destruction Sauron would unleash. They seemingly all put their feet up and waited for him to poke his head out again. I also have absolutely no idea how the Witch King has his Morgul blade back in the Fellowship of the Ring, and can only assume that they made him another one, which somewhat lessens the supposed relic status of these weapons. Pretty pathetic, huh? Additionally, this narrative thread concludes with Saruman saying, Leave Sauron to me. But we cannot possibly infer what happened next. 
either Saruman is at this point evil, and so he didn't actually hunt down Sauron, but claimed that he had, and the other members of the White Council never questioned how he had supposedly managed to do this, nor did they require any proof, nor did they ever mention it again. Alternatively, Saruman was not evil at this point, and so genuinely intended to defeat Sauron, but properly this time. He either failed to do so, or was somehow tricked into thinking that he had, or was potentially convinced at this point by Sauron to join him, and he then lied to the White Council. Neither of these explanations really make any sense due to reasons that I delved into in part 3, so I will not repeat myself here. Gandalf's magic is also far more overt in the Hobbit movies. Here is a quick rundown of the otherworldly feats Gandalf the Grey is shown to be capable of in The Lord of the Rings. He seems able to manipulate smoke, he is able to enhance his presence and voice to intimidate, he can use a form of telekinesis, he seems able to control the weather to some degree, although he fails as he was overpowered by Saruman, and he can create a kind of magical shield and shatter the stone bridge when fighting the Balrog. Much of this is very minor, although his use of magic becomes more overt after returning as Gandalf the White. Regardless, this is a very simple list of very clearly defined abilities. Now, what does Gandalf do in The Hobbit? And bear in mind, The Hobbit of course takes place before The Lord of the Rings. He uses a shield against the Necromancer, and on two separate occasions splits rocks with his staff. Both of which are abilities that are consistent with what we see from him in The Lord of the Rings. However, we also see that he is able to teleport, what? as he does so on two separate occasions, albeit with seemingly very different limitations. He can also now create gigantic explosions of light that seem to have the effect of a small bomb, and he can directly create fire. The problem with inventing new abilities for characters in a prequel to an established story is that it raises the obvious question as to why the character did not use these abilities in that original story. One example of this is R2-D2 suddenly being able to fly in Attack of the Clones, when this was never even hinted at as being something that he could do in the original trilogy. There may be explanations that an audience member can make up so as to fill the gap, such as that R2-D2 had his rocket boosters removed or something, but as it is never mentioned whatsoever in the films, the sudden revelation of this rather important ability is more than a little jarring. Similarly, if Gandalf can teleport, can bring other people with him when he does so, can detonate with the force of a small bomb, and can create fire, then it begs the question as to why he never did any of these things in The Fellowship of the Ring in particular. The extent of Gandalf's magical powers, as seen in the Hobbit trilogy, does not line up with the Gandalf we see in the Fellowship of the Ring, as there are multiple times when fighting the orcs and troll in Moria, not to mention the Balrog, when teleporting and exploding would no doubt have been extremely useful. Now on to the next point. In The Lord of the Rings we learn that the Nazgul are men who are neither living nor dead, after having been corrupted by the influence of their rings of power. They were once men, then Sauron the Deceiver gave to them nine rings of power. And now they are slaves to his will. They are the Nazgul, ring wraiths, neither living nor dead. There is a more thorough explanation in the books, but going purely by the films, this is plenty. The Hobbit trilogy then confuses this to no end by explaining that actually the Nazgul were killed. They had physical bodies that were slain and then buried, meaning that they actually were alive after having been corrupted by Sauron, but they were then defeated. Subsequently, Sauron, posing as the Necromancer, reanimated their corpses and summoned them to Dol Guldur, meaning that the Nazgul, as seen in The Lord of the Rings, are literally reanimated corpses, or in other words, zombies. This also confuses the idea that no man can slay the Witch King. Gandalf describes the Witch King as the one they say no man can kill, and the Witch King himself says no man can slay me. Given that both Gandalf and the Witch King were evidently very aware that the Witch King had been killed prior to the Lord of the Rings, it makes absolutely no goddamn sense whatsoever that they would both be of the view that he cannot be killed. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Additionally, there are of course ridiculous levels of slapstick goofiness and physics-defying nonsense in the Hobbit trilogy. This is occasionally present within the Lord of the Rings, but it is entirely constrained to the character of Legolas, as I explained in part 2. In the Hobbit films, however, we frequently see dwarves, hobbits, and men performing unbelievable feats of agility, acrobatics, and hand-eye coordination that make the setting extremely hard to take seriously. 
nearly every character seems capable of things that are, simply put, beyond superhuman. And then cut the throat yeah. and whack, whack the Glenn was saying there's a nice so, you know, bit where you just go <laughs> and take right. out about ten orcs. This was absolutely not the case in The Lord of the Rings, and so it does not fit with the established setting. But equally important is the fact that it does not fit the tone of The Lord of the Rings. This would not be a problem if the Hobbit movies were actively and clearly a departure from the tone of The Lord of the Rings, but the tone of the Hobbit movies is schizophrenic, and it spends just as much time trying to establish an amount of gravitas and importance, suggesting that the films are supposed to be taken to any degree seriously, as it does being incredibly goofy and silly, which is something I will elaborate on later in this video. Finally, The Ring is amped up in importance in the films as a result of the Lord of the Rings trilogy already existing at this point, meaning that the audience is very aware of how important The Ring ends up being. The films often become distracted from the central story of Bilbo and the dwarves retaking Erebor so as to depict the effects The Ring is having on Bilbo, which is irrelevant to this particular story. Bilbo's frequent use of The Ring also becomes confusing, Given that, as seen in The Lord of the Rings, Sauron and the Nazgul are drawn to its power. When Bilbo puts the ring on, there are seemingly no consequences for him doing so, even though Sauron and the Nazgul are very much active in this story and in this region of Middle-earth. Sauron, of course, knows that the ring has been lost, but he is always actively seeking it. If Sauron gets the ring, he wins. Even if we assume that they knew, but decided not to actively do anything as they were weakened or otherwise preoccupied, they would at the very least know that a hobbit has the ring, which makes their decision to wait 60 years before doing anything about it extremely confusing. Additionally, as I already explored in part 3, Gandalf knowing that Bilbo had a magic ring 60 years earlier than implied in The Fellowship of the Ring requires more than a little head scrambling in order for Gandalf's actions to line up. The Hobbit also deals considerable damage to a handful of characters that are present in The Lord of the Rings, however I will explore that when we get to the characters section of this analysis. Because I have received some comments from people questioning why exactly I decided to cover the extended version of the Hobbit trilogy, I have decided to elaborate so as to properly explain myself. I did briefly explain at the start of the series, but I think to avoid confusion and hopefully deflect any accusations of being either hypocritical or disingenuous, I want to clarify why I did this. Some comments have suggested that it is dishonest and in bad faith for me to cover the extended versions of the films, and then complain that these extended scenes did not need to be in the movie. I can understand why some people may feel this way, as without any further information, it may appear that I have done precisely this. So, allow me to provide some further context as to why I approached these videos in this way. Firstly, I did not know which scenes were extended or theatrical. Prior to starting this series, I had seen the first film three times and the second and third films once each. In all cases, it was the theatrical cut that I had seen, and I had not seen these films since they came out, meaning that it had been nine years since I last watched a Hobbit movie. This should clarify that my intent going into this was never to deceive anyone because I simply did not know which scenes were from which cut. It just so happened that the vast majority of the extended scenes were entirely superfluous, bloated, and unnecessary. Which brings me nicely to point number two. Just because a scene is in the extended cut and is not in the theatrical cut does not mean that it is immune to criticism. There has to be a reason for a scene to exist, extended or not. If you take a film and add in a scene for the home release for no reason other than it's more, then the scene is unnecessary and narratively pointless. The fact that it was cut from the theatrical version does not excuse it being added in the extended version. The scenes being extended is not in and of itself a justification for their inclusion. And finally, my reason for covering the extended cuts was, as stated at the beginning of the first video, so as to ensure I catch all of the good and all of the bad. My thought process here was that if I was covering The Lord of the Rings, I would absolutely be covering the extended versions. If I were to cover the theatrical versions, I would miss some absolutely critical scenes, such as Saruman's death, as well as numerous heavily character-focused scenes that we simply did not get in the theatrical cut. Some of the extended scenes in The Lord of the Rings are incredibly good, and I cannot comprehend why they were not in the theatrical cut. 
Although there are some that I would have preferred to remain cut, such as the elvish rope scene and Legolas and Gimli in the aftermath of Helm's Deep, I would not refrain from criticizing these scenes' inclusion on the basis that they were not in the original cut of the film. Additionally, parts of this analysis rely on references from the extended cuts of The Lord of the Rings, and I didn't want to omit them purely because they were not in the theatrical version. So having now analysed all three extended cuts in detail, it will probably surprise none of you when I say that unlike The Lord of the Rings, the far superior cut of The Hobbit is the theatrical one. I will quickly run through each extended scene and explain whether its inclusion is beneficial or detrimental, and I will start with the good ones. The prologue sequence is extended slightly, and the interaction between Thror and Thranduil is much clearer. The purpose of this is to add context to Thranduil's reluctance to help after Smaug takes Erebor, and also to explain his actions in the third film. I don't think this is anywhere near sufficient, but it is far better than what we got in the theatrical cut, which was almost nothing meaning that Thranduil is simply an asshole for no reason. We get a slightly extended scene of Bilbo meeting each of the dwarves, specifically Biffa and Oin. This is extremely quick, and it adds some much-needed personality to each of them. The conversation between Gandalf and Elrond regarding their quest is not crucial, but it allows the filmmakers to at least try to develop Gandalf's motives. It also provides additional foreshadowing of Thorin's fall and plants the seed that Thorin is aware of his apparent susceptibility to dragon sickness. The scene in which Gandalf discusses the necromancer with Beorn is clunky and contains some questionable dialogue, but the purpose it serves is to foreshadow much of the necromancer plot and Gandalf's discovery at the High Fells, so I could be convinced that this scene is necessary. The scene in which Boffer catches Bilbo trying to leave Erebor, and allows him to do so, is one of the best scenes in this trilogy, and also serves as critical character development for Bilbo. The sequence in which Dane's army comes to blows with Thranduil's army is far more narratively satisfying given what happens later. However, the existence of the Twiddly Widdlies I find absurd, as I explained in part 3. Finally, the funeral scene and the crowning of Dane as King Under the Mountain was excellent and is absolutely an improvement upon the original cut. Now on to the not-so-good additions. There is a quick sequence showing Bilbo enjoying Gandalf's fireworks as a child, which mostly comes off like fan service and is definitely unnecessary, but as a slight defense, it does contextualize Bilbo and Gandalf as having some kind of relationship prior to an unexpected journey, which reinforces the idea that Gandalf wants Bilbo to rediscover his youthful sense of wonder and mischief. This doesn't entirely work as Bilbo is extremely young in this scene and the existing dialogue functions entirely without this setup. There is a further sequence showing Bilbo walking around the Shire, and we see hobbits being hobbits. This sequence accomplishes nothing narratively besides showing the kind of life Bilbo is leaving behind. However, as Bilbo seems to keep to himself, and as Bilbo's reluctance to leave is due to his attachment to his home, rather than his town, this scene is largely pointless. We join Bilbo, as the book The Hobbit does, as a kind of home-loving, fairly solitary hobbit. The sequence where Keeley explains why he is not attracted to elves is also extended only, and all this scene does is provide an unnecessary setup for his infatuation with Tauriel in film 2. The sequence where the dwarves act like babies and destroy everything in Rivendell only serves to portray the dwarves as assholes, and it goes on for far too long. The following scene of Bilbo wandering around Rivendell and looking at things we saw in The Fellowship of the Ring is simply padding the runtime with nostalgia, and it of course ends with the naked wrestling match in the fountain, which is, let's go with, gratuitous. The entire sequence of the great goblin singing his silly song and then asking what the dwarves thought of it is both ridiculous, contains no useful character information, and seems to only exist so as to make people laugh at the silly cartoon man and his silly song. The scene of Oin and Boffer being very funny is also nothing more than a cheap joke that goes on for far too long. I'm beginning to sense a pattern here. Don't waste my motherfucking time! The flashback featuring Thrain and Thorin accomplishes nothing other than to set up the extended Thrain sequence in Dol Guldur, a sequence which is absolutely baffling. No, no, what do you mean? No, uh, oh, Thrain, you make no sense. The scene in which the dwarves are introduced to Beorn is terrible and painfully drawn out, as I have explained previously. The entire trippy forest sequence with the river and the hallucinations is absolutely one of the worst inclusions, because it is self-indulgent nonsense that causes continuity problems with future scenes. The scene with the master discussing his evil plan with Alfred while consuming the nut sack of a goat does nothing narratively, as in the theatrical cut we already know that they are up to something, we just don't know what. 
meaning that this scene seems to have been included because it is funny, and yet it is anything but. The quick sequence of the dwarves and Bard being attacked by the guards as they enter Lake Town is, once again, entirely unnecessary and provides no useful character information. Its inclusion, additionally, makes Bard out to be exceedingly incompetent. The scene in which Bilbo vouches for Thorin's character is purposeful and relevant from a character perspective, however it fundamentally lacks logical sense for anyone to accept Bilbo's word when they also don't know who he is, meaning that this sequence is overall absolutely a detriment. There are two further scenes featuring the Master and Alfred, which predictably accomplish nothing besides reinforcing how evil and selfish they are. The scene in which Gandalf is almost dismembered is also unnecessary, as are all of the additional references to Sauron's apparent goal of collecting the various rings of power. The scene in which Gandalf acquires a new staff from Radagast is entirely fan service and a setup for one of the most absurd additional sequences later in the film. All of the extended battle scenes, including the modified troll and the dwarven chariots, are gratuitous, overlong, and tonally inconsistent. Consistent. What I always like about Peter is that he never has that action stuff and the battle stuff at the expense of drama. The chariot sequence is just a gag-filled chase sequence, really. It does fulfill the purpose of getting them up to Ravenhill, but it uh, does it in a very long and elaborate <laughs> kind of way, which is really just a bit of indulgence. It is very indulgent, I have to admit, as a filmmaker. The demise of Alfred is incredible, but I have already said enough on that topic. The quick scene of Biffa losing the axe in his head and being freed from his status as a simpleton was quite funny, but like the other extended battle scenes, it feels very much out of place. Legolas decapitating hundreds of orcs while hanging from a bat was... yeah, I'm trying my best not to repeat myself with any of this, so let's just add that one to the list of bad extended scenes. So given that at least 80% of the extended runtime actively detracts from the film for various reasons, I think it is absolutely fair to say that the theatrical cuts are the superior versions of the film. That isn't to say that the theatrical cuts are good, far from it, but in a story already as bloated as the Hobbit trilogy, adding more bloat to the bloat pile rather predictably turned out to be a bad idea. There is a parallel I can draw between the extended cuts of the Two Towers and the Desolation of Smaug, and whilst this might not be entirely fair, I think in order to make the point I am going to dive into a scene from the Two Towers. This also gives me an excuse to dissect one of my favourite scenes from one of my favourite films, so strap in. In the extended cut of the Two Towers, we see a flashback showing us the relationship between Boromir, Faramir, and Denethor. This scene begins after Boromir has led Gondor to victory, driving the orcs out of Osgiliath. He gives a speech to the troops and is approached by his brother Faramir, and after breaking out the ale, he says, Remember today, life is good. Denethor interrupts the celebration, irritating both Boromir and Faramir, but to maintain appearances, Boromir greets his father warmly. Denethor blames Faramir for having allowed the orcs to take Osgiliath in the first place, whilst he celebrates Boromir for having driven the orcs back. This prompts Boromir to defend Faramir. Denethor then tells Boromir that Elrond has called a secret meeting, and that he has deduced that the purpose of the meeting is that the One Ring has been found. He believes that everyone will try to claim it, and he tells Boromir that the Ring must come to Gondor believing Boromir to be the only one capable of retrieving it. Denethor says that Sauron is massing his armies and that Gondor will be powerless to stop him unless they have the ring, referring to it as a gift. Bring me back this mighty gift. It is a gift. A gift to the foes of Mordor. Boromir refuses, saying that his place is with his people. Faramir then suggests that he go instead of Boromir, and Denethor mocks him, saying that he will only trust this mission to Boromir. Boromir then begrudgingly accepts, and he repeats his line, Remember today, but this time he does not finish with Life is good, and he leaves. This was the last time Faramir would see his brother. Okay, that is what happened. What does this scene tell us about these three characters? Let's start with Faramir. We see how Boromir and Faramir loved each other as brothers, which is contrasted with their relationship with their father, Denethor. We learn how important Osgiliath is to Faramir in particular, which further explains his suicide charge in Return of the King, as Osgiliath had once again been taken after Boromir had vowed that this would never happen. We learn that Faramir has tried repeatedly to impress Denethor, but to no avail, which adds context to their interactions in Return of the King. Boromir tells Denethor that Faramir loves him, which certainly speaks to Faramir's quality as a human being, to be treated so poorly by his father, to live in the shadow of his far more impressive brother, and yet to resent neither. 
He even suggests going to Rivendell himself after Boromir refuses, which is further evidence that he loves his nation, his brother, and his father, and he wants to prove himself worthy. Finally, it further drives home Faramir's heartbreaking line to his father in Return of the King. You wish now that our places had been exchanged, that I had died and Boromir had lived. And, given that we actually see the disparity with which Faramir is treated, we can absolutely take Denethor at his word. I also find it very interesting that in Return of the King, Denethor states that he wished he had sent Faramir, as he at this point believes that Faramir would have died instead, whereas he previously mocked Faramir for even suggesting that he go instead of Boromir. You? A chance for Faramir, Captain of Gondor, to show his quality. I trust this mission only to your brother. The one who will not fail me. Moving on to Denethor. Denethor's relationship with Boromir is something that is entirely absent in the theatrical cut as they share no scenes together. We only learn that Denethor loved his son very much, which is not particularly insightful. Denethor appears so enthralled by Boromir's achievements and prowess that he does not even notice Faramir until part way through their conversation, suggesting that he cares so little for Faramir that he legitimately does not even notice his presence. Regardless of to what degree Faramir is deserving of any blame, in his father's eyes, his sons are opposites. One is Gondor's finest, the other is Faramir. We learn that Denethor is extremely conscious of how he appears to the people of Gondor. He makes a big scene of congratulating Boromir for his success, and he also tells Faramir that he always casts a poor reflection on him. Denethor also does not conceal his contempt for Faramir. In the theatrical cut, we of course know that Denethor does not value Faramir at all. It is perhaps implied that Denethor's ill treatment of Faramir is either as a result of or exacerbated by the fact that Boromir has at this point been killed. This extended scene makes clear, however, that even when Boromir was alive, Faramir was always considered unworthy. We also learn that Denethor is intelligent and or resourceful enough to guess that the One Ring has been found. We don't get any further information to properly explain how he could have guessed this, but given that Denethor is the leader of one of the most prominent factions in Middle-earth, I am happy to accept that he has access to more information than might seem obvious. Denethor views Elrond's meeting as an opportunity to claim the ring. He states everyone will try to claim it, and he does not consider even for a moment that the outcome of the Council would be an attempt to destroy it. His perception is that he cannot allow anyone else to claim the ring, as Gondor needs it the most. He believes that if he does not send Boromir to Rivendell, the wizards, elves, or the dwarves will end up with the ring, that they will not use it to help Gondor, and that Gondor will subsequently fall to Sauron's forces. Denethor thinks so highly of Boromir that he suggests that the ring will not corrupt him. This, of course, further adds to the tragedy of Boromir's fall in the Fellowship of the Ring. It also helps to reinforce the power level of the ring, if a man so heroic and noble as Boromir can be corrupted by it. Denethor's reason for wanting the ring is very clear and very reasonable. Gondor is located right next to Mordor, and their soldiers have essentially been holding the evil at bay on behalf of the rest of Middle-earth. Denethor and Boromir both love their people, and acquiring the ring is perceived as a way to prevent their suffering. Moving on to Boromir. This scene establishes Boromir as a much-needed presence within Gondor. He is an excellent speaker and an imposing leader, and we already know him to be very skilled in combat. Boromir vows that the land of his people will never again fall into enemy hands, which tragically appears to have been in vain, as after he was killed in the Fellowship of the Ring, Osgiliath fell once again to the Orcs. We see very clearly how much Boromir loves his home. We learn that although Boromir was the overachiever of the family and the perfect son in Denethor's eyes, this admiration was not reciprocal. Oh, one moment of peace can not give us that. Is he? This suggests that Boromir thinks himself a man of the people who serves Gondor first and his father second. He wants to put his feet up with his brother after a hard-won victory, not be paraded around by his father like a sock puppet. Boromir is also extremely modest about his victory, claiming it to also belong to Faramir. His initial refusal to go to Rivendell is also very interesting. At first, this seems to suggest that Boromir thinks himself of more use leading the soldiers than running across the continent on a secret mission. However, let's take another look at his initial reaction to Denethor's suggestion that the ring has been found. The weapon of the enemy has been found. The One Ring. 
There are many emotions on Boromir's face here, and one of them is fear. He refers to the ring as Isildur's bane. He knows what the ring did to Isildur. Boromir did not want to go to Rivendell because he did not want to end up like Isildur. He did not want to forsake everything he loved. He did not want to fall and become corrupted. This absolutely fantastically recontextualizes everything Boromir did in The Fellowship of the Ring. Not only was Boromir's end tragic, his entire narrative within that film was tragic. He did not want to be there. He knew what may well happen to him, and yet he was still unable to fight it. His fears became true. Without this extended scene, we still have Boromir's scuffle with Frodo, his immense guilt and shame at having tried to take the ring, and his subsequent redemption in his attempt to save Merry and Pippin. With this scene, however, it makes his guilt and shame even more tragic because of the fact that he did not even want to be there, and the fact that he was well aware of the corrupting influence of the ring. Additionally, without this scene, the presumption is that most, or perhaps all, of Boromir's attempts to claim the ring were a manifestation of his corruption, courtesy of the ring itself. With this scene, we understand very clearly why Boromir needs the ring to go to Gondor, even if the ring were not corrupting him. Finally, Boromir then changes his mind about going to Rivendell after looking at the flag bearing the white tree, after Denethor says he will only trust Boromir with the mission, and after Faramir attempts to go instead. Boromir is reminded of why he does what he does. He realizes that in order to protect his kingdom and his family, he has no choice but to go to Rivendell and attempt to claim the ring for Gondor. So, in conclusion, before I return to The Hobbit, do we need to see any of this? No. In the theatrical cut, we learn exactly as much information as we need in order to understand the relationship these three had. We learn this through Denethor's grief and his subsequent interactions with Faramir. However, the extended scene provided context for Boromir's actions in the Fellowship of the Ring. Again, you can absolutely argue that this was not necessary, and that is why it was cut, but my view is that given how critical this scene is for Boromir in particular, it is inexcusable not to consider this part of the trilogy. With the added context explaining why Boromir was in Rivendell in the first place, it explains why he was so insistent on acquiring the ring. It explains why he joined Frodo on his quest in the first place. Without this context, Boromir is just some creepy guy who is corrupted by the ring a little too easily. With this context explaining who Boromir was to his father, brother, and Gondor as a whole, Boromir is probably my favorite character in my favorite film series of all time. Now to steer us back in the direction of The Hobbit, there is a comparable scene in The Desolation of Smaug in which we had the opportunity to learn about a character who was otherwise absent from the film entirely. I am referring to Gandalf's discovery of Thrain inside Dol Guldur. As I have already covered this scene in my video exploring The Desolation of Smaug, I will not repeat myself here, but I will quickly clarify where the differences lie between extended and theatrical, as well as what character information is present within the extended scene that was absent in the theatrical cut. In the theatrical version, Gandalf enters Dol Guldur, tries to cast the spell to reveal the evil within, and he is then attacked by Azog. He flees, encounters Sauron, and is captured. Thrain, Thorin's father, is not present in the theatrical cut. The sequence where he attacks Gandalf, is subdued, and then has a chat with him are entirely new additions. Thrain's death at the hands of Sauron is also a new addition, although with this exception, the scene plays out in exactly the same way in the theatrical cut, with Thrain having been digitally removed. Okay, so what do we learn in this new scene? Most obviously, we learn that Thrain is in Dol Guldur, after having been presumed dead after the Battle of Moria. We are never given an explanation as to why, and there is only really one explanation that makes any sense. He was captured by the orcs after they lost the battle, and was taken to Dol Guldur to be tortured for information. Meaning that the potential mechanisms by which Thrain is present for this scene requires that the dwarves are blind, that Azog acts contrary to his single defining character trait, that Sauron decided to keep Thrain alive for seemingly no reason whatsoever, and that he is present because of unadulterated luck which tells us absolutely nothing about the characters in question. After discovering that his friend is alive, Gandalf tries to take Thrain to safety, which is entirely at odds with his justification for being in Dol Guldur to begin with. 
Gandalf is explicitly in Dol Guldur because he has decided to, in his words, cast his friends aside in order to investigate the growing darkness and, in theory, save Middle-earth from Sauron's return. This rationale is contradicted when Gandalf, upon discovering Thrain, decides that he must escort him to safety. The charitable explanation for this might be that Gandalf intends to get Thrain out and he will then come back in to continue his investigation, but that begs the question, where exactly is he going to leave Thrain that constitutes safety? Time is of the essence, and Gandalf has already put his friends in danger to potentially prevent Sauron's return. Maybe he would do this, but given that this appears to be a direct contradiction to his previous behaviour, I think a line or some kind of acknowledgement that his priorities have changed should have been a part of this scene. Thrain recalls that Azog removed his finger in order to acquire his Ring of Power. How's the hand? This begs a couple of questions. Why did Azog cut Thrain's finger off when Thrain was alive when he could easily have killed him first, and when killing him first would have made this far easier? Not to mention the fact that Thrain is Dwarf Man and Azog wants to kill Dwarf Man. Plus the fact that in the same battle Azog killed Thor and attempted to kill Thorin. And why does Sauron want to obtain Thrain's ring? The Lord of the Rings establishes that the One Ring corrupts and controls the others, meaning surely Sauron would want Thrain to keep the ring so that he could be under his influence. We learn that Thrain was tortured for information, but that he did not break, which suggests that Thrain is an extremely tough nut to crack, which is contradicted momentarily when he asks Gandalf if he kept the map showing the secret entrance to Erebor as well as the key to the secret door safe. Gandalf tells Thrain that he gave them to Thorin, and Thrain's reaction suggests that Thorin retaking Erebor was never Thrain's intention. And it also, of course, tells us that Gandalf has forgotten that they are currently within Dol Guldur, and that the enemy has eyes and ears everywhere. I can accept Thrain bringing this up, because Thrain's mind is obviously broken and he isn't entirely all there, but there is absolutely no excuse for Gandalf being this unintelligent. However, there are no consequences for him being an idiot, so more than likely the writers didn't realise that they are depicting Gandalf as an idiot. We learn that Thrain does not want anyone to enter Erebor, as Smaug is in league with Sauron. This, again, has multiple holes in it. We are given no explanation as to how Sauron could have communicated with Smaug. We are given no explanation as to why Smaug would want to team up with Sauron. We are given no explanation as to how Thrain could possibly know that Sauron and Smaug have teamed up. Again, this is all possible, but with zero explanation it simply does not work. As this sequence is intercut with the dwarves unlocking the secret door and Bilbo venturing into the mountain, the point of all this, from an editing standpoint, is to elevate the tension for those scenes by first revealing that Thrain is absolutely terrified of the prospect of his son returning to Erebor, and then revealing that Smaug is working with Sauron. The problem, however, is that Thrain is just saying words. We have no understanding as to the thought process behind those words, or how the information was communicated to him. The result is that this feels like a cheap way to crank the tension for the Smaug scene just that little bit more at the 11th hour. And finally we have Thrain's death. I found this to be absolutely hilarious and I will try my best to explain why, Wilhelm scream notwithstanding. Thrain has been kept alive by Sauron for a lifetime. Nearly 140 years, if we reference the source material. Sauron then decides to kill Thrain for absolutely no discernible reason. Thrain's death has no impact on anything. It does not affect Gandalf's emotional state or his future actions. It does not affect any other narrative threads within the trilogy. Thrain's discovery in Dol Guldur and his deletion five minutes later are essentially a bottle episode midway through the trilogy. It just kinda happens for little to no reason and is then forgotten about immediately afterwards. So what this meant was that we had an entirely new scene involving Gandalf and Thrain, potentially allowing us to learn about Gandalf and to understand what happened to Thrain. This also had the potential of explaining some of Thorin's actions. Unfortunately, none of this happens, and the scene is an abject waste of time. It is not a waste of time because it is extended. It is a waste of time because it is shit. Hopefully this comparison of the Boromir scene and the Thrain scene makes clear that there is an immense difference in quality and character information present within these two scenes. Conceptually, they appear to be similar, but this is where the similarities end. The Boromir scene provides us with a huge amount of character information. The Thrain scene does not. 
The Boromir scene adds to the world building of the film. The Thrain scene raises far more questions than it answers. The Boromir scene is deliberate and purposeful. The Thrain scene seems to only exist to dial up the tension for the intercut Smaug sequence. The point of the Boromir scene is to explain and explore the characters present. The point of the Thrain scene is entirely mechanical, and the mechanics are incredibly flawed. Now we are going to explore the characters that appear in the Hobbit trilogy by revisiting the character notes that I compiled during my videos, which will allow us to finalise what precisely we know about each of them. As with my previous Final Autopsy video, I will go through each character in varying amounts of detail, starting with the ones with the least screen time, and finishing with the main characters. Unlike my previous Final Autopsy video, I have already placed these characters on a tier list on a live stream with some help from you guys, parts of which will be interspersed with my descriptions of each character. I am going to use the same tiers that I used for the Rings of Power Final Autopsy, however I have added three categories at the top that the characters from Rings of Power never reached. Okay, so starting at the bottom, we have the non-character tier. This is my version of not applicable. This tier is reserved for characters who I essentially don't consider to be characters. Non-characters are not usually the worst characters, even though they're here at the bottom. It's just that I want to put them in their own category because they don't belong anywhere else. So at the bottom, we have characters that break the show, or in this case, break the series or break the story. This tier is reserved for characters who are unbelievably contradictory and whose actions make the narrative progression of the story make absolutely no sense. Just above that we have the terrible characters. These characters are the worst of the worst without getting into major contradictions. So as an example, Galadriel in Rings of Power I put in terrible because she isn't contradictory, she's just absolutely terrible. Above that we have bad. Obviously these are bad characters, but they're not quite as bad as the terrible ones. They may have a redeeming quality, but there's not really going to be much to them beyond that. Right in the middle here we have the inoffensive characters, which I guess is the 5 out of 10 characters. I don't really know much about these characters, but there's going to be more to them than the characters that appear as non-characters. Above inoffensive is mostly functional. Mostly functional is the highest grade that I gave any character from Rings of Power. And just because a character is mostly functional, it does not mean that they are good, which is why good is a separate category. Mostly functional means that a character serves a clear purpose within the story, and their actions, generally speaking, make sense. Which is admittedly a low bar, but that is overall a positive. And then I've added these three tiers here that no character from Rings of Power ever achieved. We'll have to see if anyone from The Hobbit achieves them. Good characters are your standard good characters. If a character suffers from anything more severe than a very minor inconsistency, then they will not be able to enter the good category. Above that is excellent characters. These are usually going to be the best of the best. If there are any contradictions in your character, you shall not pass. And for a character to enter the excellent tier, I think it's reasonable to say that they need to have a not insignificant impact on the story. And then above that, I've also added a perfect category, which probably will not be used, but we will have to wait and see. Something I am going to touch on with regard to the characters is character arcs. In the simplest terms, a character arc is the inner journey the character goes on during a story where they change fundamentally as characters as a result of the events of the story. The mere presence of an arc is not an automatic success, however, as there are certainly degrees to which you can succeed or fail when crafting a character arc. Character arcs are also not absolutely necessary, as many great characters lack them entirely, commonly referred to as static characters. These characters do not fundamentally change during the story, although their values may well be tested during the story. The Hobbit repeatedly fails in the character arc department, as it very clearly attempts to give many of its characters arcs, but they usually fall flat for reasons that I will get into. First up on the chopping block is our favourite little evil ball of fun, Wheelie Boy. Wheelie Boy is on screen for 11 seconds, and what a glorious 11 seconds those are. We see that he is a hard worker despite being sickly and deformed. He has this little wheelie contraption thing that allows him to do his job, indicating that he has overcome his physical shortcomings. Although he doesn't actually seem to be able to write anything legible, he is clearly trying his best, he is fully devoted to being evil, and his finger is a pen. I mean, you guys are all saying perfect, so I mean, well that was, that was inevitable. I, I feel like that was gonna happen. Um, that's fine. I, will he be the only one up there? He, who knows? 
Next is the Witch King of Angmar, who appears for a grand total of 50 seconds. It is marginally higher than this, as he also appears during the fight with the White Council, but to be perfectly honest, I can't tell which Nazgul is which, and I also don't care to calculate it because there is zero character information present within this sequence. The Witch King is a plot device rather than a character in this trilogy. He has no character traits other than evil. He serves only as an extension of Sauron's will, and we can assume that everything he does is more an indicator of Sauron's character than his own. So I think that the Witch King is absolutely a non-character. And no, Wyland, there is no member berry tier, but honestly, if they only exist for member berries, they're going down here. Up next is King Thor, Thorin's grandfather, who is on screen for 1 minute and 45 seconds. Most of what we know of Thor is second hand as he dies before the events of the film. We learn that he is mighty, confident, and is skilled in combat. He also seems to be superstitious with regard to the Arkenstone, and in his interactions with Thranduil he is depicted as extremely petty, although this may well be as a result of dragon sickness. Inoffensive, mostly functional. I'm thinking that- well okay, put it this way. If Thror was in Rings of Power, he would be like among the best characters, right? So given that, I think we have to put him in inoffensive. I, yeah, I, I kind of agree, Samson. I don't think he is much of a character, but he does have more to him than the Witch King, for example. I was going to exclude Frodo from this analysis as he only exists as a framing device and any characterization he has is not relevant to this story. But given that he has a full two minutes of screen time, I may as well throw him on the tier list to make it more complete. So, Frodo exists only as a nostalgia magnet. Quite literally everything he does has zero bearing on the plot of these films, and if he were removed entirely, the films would improve. Is there any argument for Frodo appearing anywhere else? You're all saying non-character. And yeah, Thro Fro Frodo has more screen time than Thrall. So that is likely extended only. Um, but either way, extended version is what we're having to take into account. The Necromancer, later revealed to be Sauron, appears for 2 minutes and 21 seconds. During this time we learn very little about him, other than that he is confident, has insane plans that make no sense, is evil, and is extremely lucky. In order to properly explain my thoughts on Sauron in this trilogy, I need to touch on his actions with regard to the plot, as his actions are a key component of a major subplot in these films. We learn that approximately 400 years prior to the events of An Unexpected Journey, Sauron was defeated. He was evidently not killed, however, as the One Ring still exists and Sauron's power is tied to it. So Sauron gathered his remaining strength and took up residence in Dol Guldur. We learn from various sources that Sauron's ultimate goal is to collect as many rings of power as possible, and to team up with Smaug and use him as a weapon against the free peoples of Middle-earth, ultimately allowing him to take over the world despite not having the One Ring. He also wants to claim Erebor and use it to re-establish the Kingdom of Angmar, despite Angmar being hundreds of miles away from Erebor. Everything he does in these films relies upon him having the goal of world domination. Why he wants the Rings of Power, and how he is able to team up with Smaug, is never explained, but must simply be accepted. There are however multiple instances of Sauron being seemingly extremely careless and incompetent, if his goal is in fact to take over the world, suggesting that potentially he was being intentionally sloppy, thus allowing the heroes to play directly into his hands without realizing it. Meaning that we find ourselves in something of a retread of the Sauron plot from Rings of Power, in that we are having to work out whether Sauron was accidentally written to be an idiot, or if his being an idiot was actually a part of his master plan. So, in summation, Sauron allows Radagast to leave Dol Guldur both in one piece and in possession of the Morgul Blade. He also inexplicably keeps Gandalf alive in Dol Guldur after defeating him, which resulted in Galadriel arriving to rescue him. He then reveals his presence to the White Council, confirming to them that he is still very much active and a threat to Middle-earth. Sauron did not need to reveal himself here. The consequences for him doing this are that he is banished to Mordor, leading to the events of the Lord of the Rings. All of this is to say that I don't think there is any coherent argument that Sauron was deliberately revealing his evil plan to everyone in order to be banished to Mordor as part of some greater goal. The conclusion of the Battle of the Five Armies is that Sauron is soundly defeated. Smaug is dead, Azog is dead, his army has retreated and the dwarves have reclaimed Erebor. So the only argument that can be made here is that either Sauron is an idiot, or that all of Sauron's machinations in the Hobbit trilogy were a ruse with the ultimate goal of him being quote-unquote defeated once again, and luckily thrown into Mordor by Galadriel. 
I do not buy this argument, and so the only conclusion I can draw is that Sauron in the Hobbit trilogy is a moron. I, um, he's either a non-character, bad, what are we thinking? We're on sort of, let's, let's put him in bad for now, I'm thinking. Breaks the story. He's, yeah, he's really, really, really dumb and he's really lucky, but there isn't much in the way of personality to him. Next up are Bard's two daughters, Tilda and Sigrid, who appear for 2 minutes and 45 seconds and 3 minutes respectively. Both characters are extremely passive and don't really serve any kind of purpose other than as a motivation for Bard and Bane. Tilda is adorably naive, and Sigrid is shown to protect her. Neither character has any development beyond this, and they only exist as a means of contextualizing Bard's actions. Let's do- well, I mean, I think they probably go under the same category, but- <laughs> Um, mostly functional is kind of what I'm thinking. I don't- I don't think they are non-characters because they have personalities. So, um, I'm thinking mostly functional, honestly, for both of these. Next up are the three trolls, Tom, Bert, and William. All three are on screen for 3 minutes and 45 seconds, and all three are again extremely simple. One is slightly more intelligent than the other two, one is a Looney Tunes character, and one likes food. All three of them are idiots, however they are apparently intelligent enough to cook simple food and to make threats so as to disarm the dwarves, and they are apparently resourceful enough to tie up all 13 dwarves and Bilbo. I want to put them in bad because I don't think they're terrible, but I'm willing to hear an argument that they should be higher. Mega Hobbit says, you know what's funny, I give all three trolls good, they aren't awful and their scene has some weight. Realistic Delinquent says, I think they were plot critical and act like trolls should. The trolls were fine, they were plot devices, the troll characters are fine. Okay, you guys obviously like the trolls more than I do. I refuse to put them any higher than mostly functional, however. I am sorry, because yes, they are acknowledged in the film as being idiots, and they act like idiots. So the problem isn't that they're dumb, I think the problem is more in how the film uh, portrays the dwarves in relation to them. So we'll put them in mostly functional, you have convinced me. Next up is absolutely one of the highlights of the trilogy, Dane Ironfoot, who appears for four minutes. We spend less time with Dane than we do with every single character in Rings of Power, with the exception of Finrod, and Dane absolutely demolishes every single one of them. Dane is a dwarf through and through. He is ruthless, cocky, unshakable, reckless, and extremely courageous. He hates elves, possibly Thranduil in particular, and he is also shown to be an excellent military strategist. He has a very direct moral compass as he immediately diverts his forces away from the elves and towards the orcs the moment they arrive, showing no concern as to whether or not the elves were doing the same. As with many of the minor characters in this trilogy, Dane is a simple character, but he is very effective and extremely clearly defined. There are no question marks with Dane. He is predictable, explicable, and serves his purpose excellently within the Battle of the Five Armies. Dane is excellent, I will- I hear no argument against. Up next is Bard's son, Bane, who appears for 4 minutes and 15 seconds. Bane is about as simple as his sisters, but he does impact the plot far more than they do. Bane is shown to be courteous and brave, and he wants to protect his family, at one point even putting himself between them and a troll. However, every time the plot requires something of him, he starts to fall apart. He believes in fairy tales with no explanation as to why, and those fairy tales turn out to be correct. He also remembers and forgets things as required by the plot, and he is, of course, a closeted siege weapon. I, th I think Bane would be a sort of mid to good character in Rings of Power. Mostly functional? Mostly functional is what I'm hearing. Bane is inoffensive. I th well, I think that Bane is definitely worse than, like, Thraw because of the whole introduction scene in the uh, Battle of the Five Armies, so I'm thinking we'll go with mostly functional. Next up is Thorin's crazy murder hobo of a father, Thrain, who appears for 4 minutes and 30 seconds, almost all of which is in extended scenes in the desolation of Smaug. Thrain is both extremely important and extremely unimportant to the plot of this trilogy. His initial mysterious disappearance, as well as his entrusting of the map and key to Gandalf, are crucial to the narrative sequence of events. Thrain's actions allow his son to retake Erebor. However, he is also seen to be alive in Dol Guldur with seemingly no justification, he knows things he can't possibly know, he is killed for seemingly no reason, and he is entirely forgotten about after he dies. In terms of his character, he seems to have been driven mad by some combination of losing his own father as well as his experiences in Dol Guldur. Ultimately, however, he does love his son, and we see during the flashback scenes that he was more than willing to sacrifice his own life in order to save Thorin. Do you think- you guys really think he breaks the films? 
I don't think I put him that low. I think he's absolutely in terrible and non-character. I, I think that Thrain is far too complex to be a non-character. The, uh, the non-characters are for the characters that don't matter. Whereas Thrain might be terrible, but he matters. He definitely matters. I think he's bad. He's terrible or bad. Not as bad as characters from Rings of Power. Okay, I am going to put him in terrible. I don't think he, he goes any higher than that. The Great Goblin appears for 5 minutes and 30 seconds. The Great Goblin is the film's first experimentation with the childishly exaggerated pantomime clown archetype that it would double and triple down on later in the trilogy. The Great Goblin likes to sing, kills other goblins for no reason whatsoever, tells Thorin things that he has absolutely no reason to tell him, initially wants to torture the dwarves for information for no obvious reason beyond him being sadistic, but then upon seeing that Thorin was carrying Orchrist the Goblin Cleaver, decides to kill them all for some reason. He then orders that Thorin be decapitated so that he can claim his reward from Azog. This makes an amount of sense, although the fact that he didn't do this immediately does not. Ultimately, he dies because he is inexplicably able to teleport in front of everyone as they escape the caves, and because he decided to challenge Gandalf to Mortal Kombat, despite being an extremely incapable fighter himself, and despite knowing Gandalf to be a wizard, capable of taking down hundreds of goblins without even trying. So we have some trolls in here. Well, I'm not going to say trolls. Um, I love you guys, even though I know you're trolling. The Great Goblin is not S. He's a Chad, put him in excellent. The songs break the film as I couldn't take anything seriously after that point and thought all the movies were terrible. That's fair enough. I personally would put him in terrible. Nothing better than terrible. He should have been more serious. Terrible, terrible, easily terrible. Okay, right, he's in terrible. Next up is Bayorn, who appears for 6 minutes and 15 seconds. Bayorn does have a good amount of characterization in a relatively short amount of time, much of which is only present in the extended cut. Bayorn is a shape changer, and is established as being a very threatening and unpredictable person who can occasionally be reasoned with. We learn that he is the last of his kind, and we see that he lives with his animals and stockpiles food, indicating that he is both practical and very reclusive. We learn that he does not like dwarves due to their perceived lack of concern for creatures they deem lesser than themselves, indicating that Bayorn, like Radagast, likes to take care of and protect the other creatures of Mirkwood. He also hates orcs, as his people were tortured and killed by Azog. The biggest problem with Bayorn is not in his characterization. It is in the way the film undermines his characterization in the name of comedy. Because of this, Bayorn seems to be more contradictory than he may in fact be, as the film suggests that he is simultaneously twitchy, violent, and dangerous, with a particular dislike of dwarves, but also that he is very kind, generous, and compassionate. If Gandalf's descriptions of Bayorn that serve as the setup to a bad joke were removed from the film, Bayorn would likely go up a tier as a result. I see lots of inoffensives. I'm inclined to agree, because I would say I want him to be good. I think he's definitely one of the better characters in the series, however, the way he is introduced, I think, knocks him down to inoffensive. Up next is Saruman, who appears for 6 minutes and 15 seconds. Saruman is somewhat difficult to dissect because, as with Sauron, there are two ways of looking at him. Either he has already been corrupted by Sauron and so everything he does is a facade, or he is earnestly working with the White Council to defeat Sauron, only to then become corrupted after the events of the trilogy. Most of this ambiguity is only possible due to the fact that Elrond, Galadriel, and Gandalf fail to ask him to explain himself on multiple occasions, and so Saruman as depicted in this trilogy is both confusing and extremely thin in terms of characterization. Out of curiosity, what did Peter Jackson and Christopher Lee have to say about this? Christopher got to play Saruman at a time when he wasn't evil. He's Saruman the White, the noble, the decent. Anyway, Saruman doesn't approve of Gandalf meddling in mortal affairs and considers his worrying about Sauron's return to be bordering on paranoia. The film allows Saruman to explain why he believes Sauron to no longer be a threat, but it does not allow him to explain why he doesn't want Thorin to retake Erebor. Additionally, we learn that Saruman highly values power, and we see that he himself is extremely powerful and is very confident in his abilities. You guys are saying good or mostly functional. He's almost a non-character, mostly functional, inoffensive, member berries, evil or dumb, inoffensive. This is the thing is I have to uh, separate Christopher Lee from Saruman because I fucking love Christopher Lee. And honestly, I fucking love Christopher Lee as Saruman. But 
very little of what he does really makes any sense. I'm leaning towards bad. He's not that out of line with the way that he is in um, in The Lord of the Rings, partly because a lot of his actions make more sense if he's evil, but yeah. The master of Lake Town, in the book he's there, but he's not fully drawn, so to speak. But he had a huge amount of potential. That's what we saw in the character. The master of Lake Town, or Evil McGee, as he is referred to in my videos, appears for 6 minutes and 30 seconds. The master's characterization is definitely one of the weakest parts of this trilogy, as he is incredibly irritating and fundamentally unbelievable. So when it came to talking to Stephen about his character, this was really good fun. Because we, in the end, couldn't get revolting enough. There is very little to him, but what little there is seems to be reinforced with every single line he delivers. So the problem with the Master is not so much that he is inconsistent or contradictory, it is more so that he is aggressively one-note and simplistic. So what do we know about the Master of Lake Town? He trades with Thranduil, and he is very wealthy. He rules over Lake Town as a dictator, making up laws so as to imprison people he doesn't like, and he is entirely motivated by his desire to accumulate additional wealth. The Master is used on three separate occasions to drive the plot. He imprisons Bard, he agrees to release Thorin, and he pushes Alfred overboard with the intention of leaving him to die. All three of these actions are singularly justified by his goal of acquiring lots of money. The Master is incredibly greedy and paranoid, is as selfish and self-serving as is humanly possible, is tremendously incompetent as a leader, is a hypocrite, and inexplicably believes himself to be both intelligent and physically attractive. This character is, simply put, a bad joke that goes on for 6 minutes and 30 seconds longer than it needed to. And the existence of a character as outrageous as this within Middle-earth is something I cannot accept. The Honoured One says he rubs his hands together after burning down an orphanage and then twirls his moustache. You pretty much banged the nail on the head. He's just evil who man who's evil. Children's cartoon tear bad guy terrible. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. He's going in terrible. I will hear I will hear no argument to the contrary. Next on the list is Bolg, who appears for 8 minutes and 30 seconds. Bolg has nearly three times as much screen time as Lurtz in The Lord of the Rings, and very little is done with that extra screen time. We don't really know much about Bolg other than that he is an evil evil henchman. We know he listens to Azog, possibly due to him being the spawn of Azog. He is built like a brick shithouse, and he is narrowly beaten in a fight by Legolas, suggesting that he would win in a 1v1 against virtually any non-wizard in Middle-earth. And the only moment of anything approaching nuance to his character is the revelation that he is willing to lie to Azog in order to cover up his own failure. He's definitely not higher than inoffensive, but I also don't think he's terrible. He's in one of the three middling categories. Good, there's no contradictions. That is a good point. Dragon Knight, fucking hell. I can't be putting Bolg in good. I'm sorry. I take your point. Bolg is not contradictory. He's just extremely simple, which means the highest I think he's going to go is inoffensive. Uh, because, yeah, he's a mini boss that is given a hell of a lot of screen time. He's functional as a character. Let's go with, I think, mostly functional. I've got to make a decision. We're going to say mostly functional. Next up is Galadriel, who appears for 9 minutes and 15 seconds. Galadriel is shown to have a very close relationship with Gandalf, and she also maintains her aura of ethereality and otherworldliness that was so effective in her depiction in The Lord of the Rings. Galadriel seems endeared by Gandalf's playful cheekiness, and she also places a high degree of trust in his judgement. She is generally treated like a god, seemingly being able to evaporate, she can predict the future to some degree, and she is able to vaporise things with her mind. Overall, her depiction in The Hobbit is not out of line with her depiction in The Lord of the Rings. However, she does suffer from the consequences of the subplot in which she appears, in that she is required to be extremely naive and careless by not taking any further action prior to the events of The Lord of the Rings. Her scene with Gandalf is S-tier. I agree with that. I love that scene. Uh, whether I did when I did the video, I don't know, but on rewatch, I do like that scene a lot. HP says I think she's bad, mostly functional, mostly functional, inoffensive. Okay, I am going to decide I would have put her in inoffensive. I don't think that she's good, but yeah, I, th I think we're going to put her, we'll put her there in inoffensive. Up next is Elrond, who appears for 10 minutes. Elrond, like Galadriel, is virtually untarnished by the events of the trilogy, 
but is similarly damaged by the implications of what he did or did not do between the two trilogies. Elrond is established to be a bit of a dick in that he speaks to the dwarves in a language he knows they cannot understand, presumably because he finds it funny to wind them up a bit. He is, however, very polite when dealing with Thorin, who clearly does not like him. He is also welcoming and generous and is more than willing to help, and he seems to be very wise. Elrond is also reasonably cautious as he voices concern to Gandalf about the consequences of releasing Smaug, and also with regard to Thorin being crazy. Um, good, good, mostly good, 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 inoffensive, good. I'm thinking we've got our first good. Radagast appears for 10 minutes and 30 seconds, and in that time we learn that he loves animals but is mostly useless. He seems capable of rudimentary magic in the form of healing, he has rabbits that can run fast, and it is implied that he is addicted to the magic of mushrooms. He is also extremely unhygienic, having literal bird shit perpetually on his face. We have to make sure that his poo looks like it did a year ago. People actually do collect my poo. Radagast is shown to be very pragmatic, prioritizing the overall safety of Middle-earth over any one life, or specifically any 14 lives, and he successfully convinces Gandalf to do the same. The main issue with Radagast is that of tonal inconsistency. His character design and his personality quirks are very comical and exaggerated, making him seem not to fit within the world in which he has been placed. However, there isn't anything majorly wrong with him in terms of his construction within the narrative. My view of Radagast, I was very harsh on him in my videos because he pisses me off. Dragon Knight, I, I completely agree. So just because I don't like him doesn't mean he isn't functional. So I would i don't think that radagast is actually bad zach says i think terrible same as the goblin king i can't take the movie seriously with him on screen that is true however radagast's actions in the films are nowhere near as baffling as the goblin king what really really dumb things does radagast do there are things that radagast does in terms of how he sort of generally behaves and conducts himself that I could be like, come on, man, what are you doing? I don't believe that this character is real. And there are other times when he teleports and had he not done so, everyone would have died. But that's not his, that's not his character. That's his implementation. So we're going to stick Radagast in Mostly Functional. Up next is Alfred, also known as the infamous Greasebag McMonobrow. He has more screen time than Aomer, Denethor, or Wormtongue in The Lord of the Rings. As with the Master of Lake Town, Alfred is far and away one of the worst parts of this trilogy. I won't spend too much time on him here, as I gave a pretty in-depth conclusion on this character in Part 3, but I will summarize. Alfred is as one-dimensional as they come. He exists to be laughed at, but he is apocalyptically unfunny. He is kept alive after the opening of the Battle of the Five Armies, seemingly purely to provide comic relief and to serve as a foil to Bard during the Dale scenes. However, neither of these things are necessary in the overall narrative, and his increased screen time very likely came about as a result of the decision to split the story into three movies. The character does not serve any kind of mechanical purpose, and he could be deleted from the film entirely without anything of value being lost. I mean, just go with it. And should I do a big... No. No. Please. This is not over the top. This is, a, this is not a cartoon. What are you retarded? Rather than repeat my list of his incredibly basic character traits, I will conclude with this. Alfred does not act like a person. He does not have any awareness of the fact that other people have brains and are capable of cognition, and are therefore very aware that he is gaslighting, lying, and pretending to be something that he is not. Alfred is easily one of the most absurd additions to the Hobbit trilogy, and although he is only on screen for 11 minutes, those are 11 minutes too many. He wasted our time. Terrible, 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 worm tongue wannabe. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're basically all saying terrible, unless you're memeing. So he's terrible. Next up is a character that the films could easily have fumbled, but thankfully he remains entirely consistent with his depiction in The Lord of the Rings. Gollum appears for 11 minutes and 30 seconds. He is characterized as being deranged and violent, having split personalities, one hostile and one less so, although there are hints that these two personalities are not quite as distinct as they may initially seem. He is very excited to play games with Bilbo, as he is likely the first non-goblin he has interacted with in an extremely long time. I previously claimed that Gollum was shown to be honourable, as although he armed himself with a rock, he did not cheat in the game of riddles with Bilbo. However, upon being informed that he had lost, he reaches for the ring, only to discover that it was no longer in his pocket. 
This presumably means that his intention was to turn invisible so as to ambush Bilbo in order to kill and eat him, despite the fact that he had promised to lead him out of the cave. He also seems to be incredulous that Bilbo had breached his trust and stolen from him. His reaction seems to be more than a simple panic upon losing his precious. His reaction also indicates shock, rage, amazement, and pure seething hatred. So Gollum in The Lord of the Rings stays right the fuck where he is. He's perfect. Because you guys are all saying perfect, and I, I don't have a problem with that. Colonel Falcar says Gollum had no change in The Hobbit, Andy Serkis just reprised his role exactly. Yeah. Essentially, essentially that. Next up is the secondary antagonist behind Smaug, Azog the Defiler, appears on screen for 13 minutes. In that time, we don't learn a huge amount about him, however, he is by no means anything approaching the worst character in this trilogy. Azog is depicted as having one single driving motivation to destroy the line of Durin. He agrees to work with Sauron, provided Sauron facilitates Thorin's death. He personally kills Thor, Feely, and eventually Thorin. Although for some reason he allows Thrain to live during the Battle of Moria, for reasons that can only be inferred. Azog is very pragmatic and strategic, however he is ultimately obedient and will not defy Sauron's orders. His overconfidence leads to his demise, although not before he deals a killing blow to Thorin. Azog is, like many of the characters we have covered so far, extremely simple. However, he serves a very clear purpose in this story, and he is used very deliberately, which contrasts with how the writers used similarly simplistic characters, such as Alfred. Azog is a mostly effective antagonist that serves as a constant source of tension in an unexpected journey, but he is then mostly forgotten about until his climactic showdown in the Battle of the Five Armies. I think he's, he's sort of mid- Tear is what I'm thinking. Melanistic Yemen. Why does he want to wipe out the line of Durin? Um, that's a good question. Moving on. Inoffensive, mostly fun. I'm thinking, I don't think he's inoffensive because I think there are problems with him. Uh, the fact that he monologues and just tells people, he just says exactly what he's thinking at all times. I think he's going in mostly functional. I don't think he's going any higher than that. Thranduil is a very interesting character who could have been even more interesting if these films were better than they ended up being. He appears for 17 minutes and he is one of very few characters in this trilogy that I am comfortable describing as complex. Very good, Kronk. Thranduil's past is mostly a mystery. We only learn that his wife was killed and it is implied that he risked his life to try to save her. His core motivation in the films is extremely frustrating because it had the potential to be excellent, but parts of it were inexplicably cut from the film. We had a backstory for these white gems that he literally goes to war over. And we thought, okay, these gems were made and fashioned for his wife and that she never got to wear them. The dwarves of Erebor were hired to make a necklace for Thranduil's wife, but she died before the necklace could be completed. Thranduil then attempted to get the gems back from the dwarves to keep in her memory, but Thror refused to return them to him. Inexplicably, none of this is in the film. All we know from the film is that he really, really wants these gems, and it is up to the audience to fill in the blanks. This additional idea that the gems were intended for Thranduil's dead wife was entirely fabricated by the writers of the films, and yet they didn't commit and actually include this in the movies. There is something to be said for brevity, and if the Hobbit trilogy was tighter than a nun's chocolate speedway, then I could be convinced that explaining Thranduil's motivation is not crucial to the story of Thorin retaking Erebor. However, in a film series filled to the brim with unnecessary levels of horseshit, that is not an argument one can make. There is no justification for failing to explain this clearly. Anyway, Thranduil is depicted as jealous, petty, and lacking in honor. He is extremely selfish, he does not seem to care about the world beyond his borders, and he has become cynical as a result of his past. Unlike the Master and Alfred, we understand why Thranduil is the way he is. He is not simply evil for the sake of being evil. Thranduil appears to hold grudges, however he does offer to release Thorin provided Thorin returns the gems to him, a deal which is entirely fair and reasonable, suggesting that he actually has no real interest in being combative with the dwarves. He simply wants his gems. Thranduil is also shown to be proud, highly valuing social status, and we learn that he is a very controlling father. He is distrustful of Gandalf, is generally suspicious of those he does not know, but he is not easy to fool. On the more positive side of things, Thranduil is very generous with his allies, indicating that he is apt at maintaining diplomatic relations. He highly values loyalty, and he is an extremely skilled warrior. Thranduil is, however, implied to be a poor military strategist. 
He clearly values the lives of his soldiers to an immense degree, and it is implied that rather than being born of a dislike of any of the other races, this is due to the fact that elves are immortal, and therefore their deaths are that much more tragic. It is also implied by Bilbo in the prologue that the reason he did not help the dwarves was because he was unwilling to risk the lives of his soldiers against Smaug. Which is very different to if he was simply refusing to help because the dwarves were mean to him. However, some of the actions taken by his soldiers during the battle are simply incongruent with this core belief. Meaning that in order to have cool action, the writers damaged one of their best characters. Thranduil is also one of the few characters in the trilogy to have an arc, albeit a rather simplistic one. Throughout the third film, he becomes distanced from Legolas and ends up accepting that he can no longer control Legolas's life. We always like to imagine, as part of a backstory, that she died defending her child, because that's one of his last lines to Legolas. Your mother loved you. He also appears to accept that Tauriel and Keeley's love was real when he had previously viewed it as something akin to an ill-advised fling. This is informed by his implied history with his own wife, and ultimately in both cases Thranduil acknowledges that he was wrong. Unfortunately, we never get any closure for Thranduil, and it is ultimately unknown if he ever received the gems from Dane. And so his story concludes in an open-ended question. 52% of you guys are saying good or excellent. It's interesting that so many of you guys think he's worse than that. My gut instinct is that he's up here, because I the fact that he is a poor military strategist isn't necessarily a character- it's not like a fault, a flaw, or a contradiction or anything. I wish there was more of him, which I think is he's one of the only characters that I can say that about. Bleaters says, Should I assume the tactics used by the elves in the battle are Thranduil's? I think we have to assume that they did what he said, because he's their commander. But again, I'm not certain how much that damages him. This guy is rather complex, too complex for the movie's writing. That's possible. He's okay, underdeveloped. Let's leave him in good for now, although personally I think he is... He's prob he probably belongs in excellent. So we will leave him there for now, but there are too many of you guys that are saying, like, more than half of you think he should be lower than good. So I'm gonna leave him in good. Legolas is a character that definitely did not need to be in these films, but the more important question is what did the writers actually do with him in his 17 minutes and 30 seconds of screen time? Rather surprisingly, Legolas does have a pretty clear character arc that fits with his depiction in The Lord of the Rings relatively well. <coughs> When we first meet him, he is extremely hostile towards dwarves, very likely as a result of having Thranduil for a father. He is shown to be very jealous of Keeley, and seems to be frustrated by Tauriel's sudden romantic interest in Keeley. Legolas is extremely skilled in combat, although much of his prowess is dialed up past the point of absurdity, meaning that when once he was a highly trained superhuman multi-millennia year old warrior, he is now a gravity-defying weightless magic man who surfs on everything. I personally thought that him hanging upside down from a bat was kind of the dumbest idea I'd, I'd, I'd ever, ever, ever heard of in the entire six films. Legolas appears to be highly motivated to purge the world of evil, as this is how Tauriel convinces him to come with her to Lake Town. He initially becomes involved in the plot because he appears to be trying to court Tauriel, despite her showing no romantic attraction towards him. Upon arriving in Lake Town, he is shown to care more about fighting orcs than about protecting Bard's family or the badly wounded Keeley. We later see that he cares more about staying with Tariel, even if platonically, than obeying his father, potentially indicating that he has a great deal of respect for her, even if she is actively pursuing Keeley. By the end of the trilogy, Legolas has seemingly learned that Thranduil's passive isolationist nature is not going to help in the ongoing fight against evil, and he decides not to return home. The problems with Legolas are that he, along with Tauriel, suffer from main character syndrome, in that they are inexplicably and exponentially more skilled than the other elves without justification. Additionally, Legolas's relationship with Bolg is thoroughly confusing. Legolas was aware of who Bolg was prior to fighting him in Lake Town, and his behaviour seems to indicate that he wants Bolg dead at all costs, which would be in line with his desire to kill everything that is evil. However, Legolas for some reason stopped chasing Bolg, only to then start chasing him again, and no explanation is ever given as to why he did this. My guess is that the writers wanted to leave this thread open as an additional cliffhanger at the end of The Desolation of Smaug, and they also wanted him to team back up with Tariel so that they could go on an adventure. Additionally, Legolas was willing to return to his father after the messenger had summoned him, but he changed his mind after hearing that Tariel had been banished. 
Had Tauriel not been banished, they both would have returned to the Woodland Realm instead of riding to Gundabad. This means that Legolas was not single-mindedly driven by a desire to kill Bolg, as he was initially willing to obey Thranduil's command to return home. Ultimately, Legolas is absolutely an unnecessary character in this story, but at the very least he is relatively inoffensive in terms of his characterization. Most of the problems with Legolas are not with his decision making or his character arc, they are with how the film depicts his combat skills. Fan service gone wrong? I'm not sure he does anything that improves the film. His writing is decent enough, but his action scenes were worse. Lord Wah Wahoo, uh, I agree with that. I don't think he's bad, so I am going to put him in Mostly Functional, because a good chunk of you also think he's better than Mostly Functional. As for the purpose he serves in the film with regard to the love triangle and the silly action scenes, he's down here. As a character, I think he's Mostly Functional. Finally, with regard to the trio of elves, Tauriel appears for a total of 19 minutes and 30 seconds, which is comparable to the amount of time we spent with Faramir in The Lord of the Rings. Tauriel exists within these films entirely to partake in a love triangle. She does not do anything else. She is simply Elf Lady, hence why I decided to give her the nickname Ladyless. We created the character of Tauriel because we're going to have 13 old dwarves with long beards. We have Gandalf, of course Bilbo, and we've got Legolas. Thranduil and we have Bard, you really feel the weight of that. It becomes a very blokey story quite quickly. Look, you obviously don't know anything about intelligence. We see early on that she distrusts dwarves, but she very quickly comes round to the idea of choking on Keeley's custard launcher. We learn that she is of a lower social standing than Legolas, and that she is a captain in Thranduil's guard. Like Legolas, she is unbelievably skilled in combat, but is tragically impaired when it comes to constructing sentences that are not cringeworthy, possibly due to the fact that she is an entirely original creation of the writers. She is shown to be willing to manipulate Legolas in order to try and save Keeley, believing that he would follow her to Lake Town like a lover sick puppy, despite her seeming to have no romantic interest in him, and ultimately she is only able to save Keeley because Boffer went and found some king's foil. Tariel is established as caring about children, but she also allows children to run into what should be certain death. She is unfathomably and impossibly naive and inexperienced with Middle-earth, despite being an elf who is at the very least hundreds if not thousands of years old. She is unfamiliar with Gundabad and the Kingdom of Angmar despite them being located, in the grand scheme of things, extremely close to where she lives. She is also seemingly entirely unfamiliar with the concepts of both love and death. Gundabad. An orc stronghold in the far north of the Misty Mountains. What lies beyond? The ancient kingdom of Angmar. Why does it hurt so much? Overall, Tauriel is a colossal waste of time, and I find it thoroughly amusing that the reason she exists at all is because of the lack of female characters in the source material. These stories really do lack female characters. We did look at where the opportunities lay for creating a good, strong female character that could have her own story. And yet her singular purpose is to be one axis of an extremely forced and unconvincing love triangle. Uh, she's not great, but don't be mean to the poor girl. <laughs> We've got terrible, little to no impact on the story, she's just bad or terrible. She's bad, but not on the same level as Greasebag. Given most of you say bad, I am going to say terrible. Let's put her at the top of terrible. She's not quite as bad as some of the others. <laughs> Mark Hedlow is just a funny, great guy with a really interesting face. And now we come to the first of the dwarves. Dory has 20 minutes and 15 seconds of screen time. He is shown to be slightly bipolar and appears to suffer from rather intense mood swings. On some occasions, Dory is seen to be highly cultured and somewhat effeminate, particularly for a dwarf, and he is extremely well-spoken. On other occasions, he seems to have a short temper, is very aggressive, and is prone to violence if left unrestrained. His main relationship in the films is with Ori, to whom he fulfills a parental role, frequently taking care of or protecting the much younger and more naive Ori. Dory is ultimately very forgettable, and much of what I have gathered about Dory's bipolar characterization was almost certainly unintentional, and was likely as a result of Dory being one of the other dwarves to whom lines of dialogue would be distributed as and when it was deemed that they hadn't spoken in a while. The bi and racist one? I don't think he's bi or racist, <laughs> what the fuck? Actually, yeah, Thorin might be racist, we'll get to that later. Non-character is general. I don't think any of the dwarves fall into non-character. Well, no, there's an argument you can make for two of them, but I don't think, I don't think, um, Dory is one of them. I think if he was in Rings of Power, he would be one of the better characters, so for that reason, I'm putting him in inoffensive. Oh, yeah. 
Up next is Nori, who appears for 20 minutes and 30 seconds. We learn that he really likes gold, he is extremely rude to his hosts, he is a thieving asshole, indicating that he is also very selfish and inconsiderate, like many of the dwarves he is not superstitious, and he also butts heads with Dwalin at one point after he suggests that they flee from a confrontation. Nori is totally forgettable, and the only reason he is in this film is because there needed to be 13 dwarves. I remember literally nothing about him, he loves stealing stuff, the most non-character of all the dwarves. We're gonna go with bad. Next is Oin, who appears for 20 minutes and 45 seconds. Oin is, like most of the dwarves, extremely simplistic. However, he does have a bit more going for him than many of the others. Oin is initially characterized as the Deaf One, as he always carries his ear trumpet with him in order to be able to communicate. He is clearly older than most of the others, and he believes in the prophecy, possibly indicating that the reason he decided to join Thorin is because of his faith in the prophecy. Oin is later established as being a skilled medic, as he stays behind in Lake Town to heal Keeley rather than accompanying Thorin to Erebor, indicating that his priority is to help the wounded. However, as soon as they escape Lake Town, Oin does not appear to consider staying and helping the wounded civilians, which would have been the perfect opportunity to develop him a little, but of course this facet was not explored, presumably in favour of giving the love triangle additional screen time. Oin, like many of the dwarves, is also occasionally an idiot, as in one notable instance, he seems to believe antagonising his captors to be handling this. Most of you guys are saying mostly functional. I don't mind Oin. I, I think I like Dory more than Oin. I don't think I'm going to move Dory. He's a nice old guy. Oin and Gloin are my favourites. He's a dwarf and he's deaf. That's it. Non-character. You guys are saying mostly functional. I think I completely agree. I don't really have much of a problem with Oin. Biffa is an interesting one. He appears for 21 minutes and 15 seconds, and we know essentially nothing about him. He, of course, has an axe in his face, so he presumably is or was a fighter. I had assumed that he was cognitively challenged as a result of the axe lodged in his brain, which makes an amount of sense, but it turns out he was speaking dwarvish the entire time rather than gibberish, meaning that the intention here was that his injury affected what language he was able to speak, which makes decidedly less sense. The idea that maybe one of the dwarves was unable or unwilling to speak English, or common, is an interesting one. The idea that Biffa lost the ability to speak English due to a head injury is farcical. Biffa is a joke of a character, and whilst that joke was mildly amusing, there is nothing to his character beyond this. We're gonna put Biffa in non-character. Next up is the primary villain of the trilogy, Smaug, appears for 21 minutes and 30 seconds, 17 minutes of which is in the desolation of Smaug. He is established to be highly egotistical, proud, and vain, believing himself to be virtually invincible. He is clearly unhinged and psychopathic, and he does what he does for no reason other than that no one can stop him. In his discussion with Bilbo, he does seem to be genuinely curious about him, and he is also very intelligent, perceptive, and outwardly polite. He is shown on multiple occasions to be sadistic, to relish in the misery of others, as well as being very theatrical in his delivery of death and destruction. The prolonged chase sequence in The Desolation of Smaug, however, reduces him to a rabid animal with no personality, whose sole purpose is to kill the dwarves. This sequence is one that actively damages Smaug as a character, as the writers decided that they wanted him to be both intelligent and articulate for his conversation with Bilbo, but also that they wanted him to be a brainless movie monster for the chase scene. If this sequence were not in the film, Smaug would improve as a character by an order of magnitude. Additionally, Smaug, simply put, goes out like a bitch. He can clearly see both Bard and Bane on the bell tower, and he is very aware of the weak spot in his own armour and of the existence of Black Arrows. So it is true. What did you say? Quivering <laughs> cowards with their long bows and black arrows. And yet he does not show any urgency in preventing them from constructing a makeshift siege weapon to bring him down, preferring to taunt and mock Bard about the imminent death of both him and his son. This is partially justified by Smaug's overconfidence and vanity, and it also means that his own egotism led to his demise, However, this doesn't entirely work because, as depicted in the film, Smaug chose to let Bard try and kill him, presumably believing that he would fail. This is at odds with his foreknowledge of his own weak spot as well as his supposed high level of intelligence. In the M4 book edit, Smaug is unironically 
pretty much right there. Every problem that I had with Smaug is removed from that cut of the film. It, he's fantastic in that in that cut. You guys are saying good slash excellent. If it weren't for the abruptness of his death or the gold statue, he would be perfect. Uh, yeah, and his behavior during the chase scene where he's just giant dinosaur. Um, Inglorious Baxter says, amazing. Just give me three films of Bilbo, Smaug, and Gollum. Smaug is so good when he first appears, then he becomes a complete bean brain. Strange fitty. Uh, yeah, you're not wrong. I think Smaug is either excellent or good. We're going to put him in good. Next up is Gloin, who appears for 21 minutes and 30 seconds. Gloin is extremely sparsely characterized. He, like Oin, is superstitious, having faith in the prophecy, and he is shown on multiple occasions to really like gold. However, unlike Nori, he does not appear to be an asshole in his desire to accumulate wealth. Gloin is also, of course, Gimli's father, and my presumption is that the writers decided not to bother characterizing him beyond his familial connection to a character we know from The Lord of the Rings. He just blends in. Fan service, he's only here to facilitate Gimli's name being dropped to Legolas is bad. He's not even characterized. Gloin was their best outlet for justifiable yet subtle member berries, but they blew it in favor of one way too obvious and dumbed down moment. Um, yeah, I think I completely agree with that because Gloin is the one that basically everyone would have known going in, which then makes me wonder why they didn't give him a bigger role because there are, there are dwarves, like I guess the big four or big five, if you include Thorin, have much larger roles than Gloin. So I'm kind of surprised that they didn't give Gloin a larger role. I'm going to go with mostly functional. And now for something completely different. Ori appears for 21 minutes and 30 seconds. Ori is, for some reason, extremely childish and clumsy and is arguably the Jar Jar Binks of the Hobbit trilogy. Thankfully, however, he is nowhere near as pivotal as Jar Jar, so he is relatively easy to ignore. He appears to be very clean, is relatively polite, and likes to tidy up after himself. Ori is shown to be socially oblivious and makes a fool out of himself without realizing. He says stupid things, is implied to be stupid by the other characters, but seems incapable of understanding why his behavior would prompt this response. He is also the youngest in the party, he appears to be a scribe rather than a warrior, which is further supported by the fact that the corpse Gandalf takes the book from in Fellowship of the Ring was Ori's corpse. My guess is that the writers started with the knowledge that Ori was a scribe, and so turned him into the autistic nerd of the party, and so that is where much of the childish humor comes from with regard to his characterization. Ori even deliberately looks to Dory after misbehaving, as if to say, ho ho ho, look at me, I'm being naughty, in a manner not unlike that of an unruly seven-year-old. However, he is actually the first of the dwarves to try and save Bilbo after the thunder battle, indicating that he is extremely brave and is more than willing to risk his life to save others. My take on Ori has changed a little bit. I kind of view him similar to Radagast in that the way the character is portrayed pisses me off, but what he does is not really a problem. Luke says, I hate this dwarf. Melanistic Yemen says, I grew irrationally angry every time he spoke. Yeah, he's definitely a liability. I am going to lean towards bad. Yeah, I think he's worse than Gloin and Oin, for example. Up next is the fat, Bomber, who appears for 21 minutes and 45 seconds. Like Biffa, Bomber is a one-note character, and that note is that he is fat. There are a handful of gags along the lines of, wow, isn't it funny that the fat one can do that? Tad, excessive. It's surprising the culture. <laughs> Cards too, so you should come out and learn. <laughs> Bomber doesn't appear to be able to speak whatsoever, although in the extended cut of the Battle of the Five Armies, he says, Here you go, cousin. And that's the first time that Bomber speaks. And the only time that Bomber speaks. And I have absolutely no idea why this is the one time he speaks. I don't know what to draw from this. All I can say is it, it's just dumb. I think that, yeah, Biffa and Bomber are the two that you can argue are non-characters. He's just big ginger. He's there for the fat jokes and nothing else. Wyland, non-character. They had no idea what they wanted to do with him. They just made him lame, predict predictable jokes about him. Uh, he exists to be a joke and gray, yes. Alberto Fernandez, his barrel has more personality. Let's leave it there. So yeah, Bomber is a non-character. Next in line is Boffa, or Bofa. The film isn't exactly clear on how to pronounce his name. Boffa, Boffa, Bomber. Boffa, Boffa, Bomber. Boffa, Boffa. Boffa appears for 26 minutes and 15 seconds, which is very slightly less time than we spent with Boromir in The Lord of the Rings. Boffa is the first dwarf that has anything approaching an adequate level of characterization, 
However, his characterization is inconsistent at best. Boffer is shown repeatedly to look out for Bilbo. He is highly observant and seems to have a very close relationship with Bilbo in particular. He is loyal both to Thorin and Bilbo, he is skeptical, and he seems knowledgeable about dragons. However, he is also very insensitive and he does not value other people's possessions. He seems entirely incapable of reading social cues, is unruly, sarcastic, and occasionally cartoonishly unintelligent. Boffer has two scenes that I think are mostly excellent, the scene where he confronts Bilbo as he tries to return to Rivendell, and the scene where he allows Bilbo to leave Erebor. Both of these scenes are fully coherent with the character that I think the writers wanted Boffer to be. He is the friendly, approachable one. He is Bilbo's anchor, and the writer's way of allowing Bilbo to emotionally bond with one specific dwarf rather than trying to make him bond with all 13 of them. However, like many characters in these films, Boffer is also used for comedy that reduces him to a bumbling moron, and although he has development, much of that development is incoherent with what he does in his filler scenes. Melanistic Yemen says, I really like how he has a similar convo with Bilbo at the start and the end of the journey. Absolutely, fucking lootly I really like both of those scenes, and if that was it, this character would be, like, good if not excellent. Great scenes with Bilbo. He has a dumb scene in the opening of Desolation, but he's mostly okay. And Rob Sanderson says they bulked out the part with too much filler to give the famous actor more to do. That was to the detriment of the character. We're going to put him in inoffensive. Bard, whom I referred to as Gaston because I am hilarious, appears for 27 minutes. He is one of the better parts of the trilogy, generally speaking, although he is ultimately unable to escape from the writers wanting to give him a far larger role than he had in the books, but not knowing what they actually wanted to do with him. Bard is shown to be highly confident, is willing to manipulate people in order to get paid, and is willing to break the law for money. Bard is primarily concerned with providing for his family, and he is not shown to be wealthy, which explains his willingness to earn money outside of the law. He is initially shown to be somewhat morally grey, however, this ambiguity does not last very long at all. We soon learn that Bard is the town hero, and that he has a habit of doing what's best for the people of Lake Town, which causes conflict between him and the powers that be, as the powers that be have a habit of doing what is worst for the people of Lake Town. He is revealed to be the descendant of Girion, Lord of Dale, yet Bard shows no desire to become a leader himself, and he is almost embarrassed and ashamed of Girion's failure to kill Smaug over a century prior. He is nevertheless forced to lead the people of Lake Town due to the events of the film, a role that he ultimately embraces by the end. Bard is extremely brave and proactive, he is honourable, and he does his utmost to avoid needless violence. However, Bard is also shown to have varying levels of intelligence depending on what the scene requires. He seems confident in his skills as a smuggler, yet his abilities as a smuggler leave much to be desired. He is extremely forgetful and also places an unfathomable and unjustifiable level of trust in Alfred, a decision which reasonably could have led to many needless deaths. Bard's character arc, I assume, is intended to be that he goes from a somewhat down-on-his-luck commoner struggling to make ends meet, and he gradually embraces his destiny as the only one who can kill the dragon and save the town. Fundamentally, I have no problem with the films expanding on the character of Bard. In the source material, Bard is the captain of a company of archers, and he is the descendant of Girion. That's it. And whilst I do think it may well have been anticlimactic to have some guy kill Smaug, I do wish that the character work we received for Bard had not detracted from his character arc. As depicted in the Hobbit trilogy, Bard goes from the town hero to the town hero. Justin Brush, his good parts generally outweigh his moronic trust of Greasebag. I want to agree with that. The question is how high was he before his uh, moronic trust of Greasebag? He's not terrible, but the plot doesn't do him many favors from Bryce. Yep. Film Guy says it would be cool if he was just a courageous guy. Yes, because essentially that's the way he was in the book. But uh, expanding on him and turning him into the bargeman who actually gets to know the dwarves before all of that, I don't mind that. The problems come afterwards. Simon D'Amico says Bard would have been an immensely better character if the Master and Greasebag didn't exist at all, but his script is bogged down by theirs. Completely agree with that, yes. So we'll put him at the bottom of inoffensive or the top of mostly functional. Up next is Feely, who appears for 27 minutes and 30 seconds. Feely does not have nearly enough characterization to make his death as impactful as it should have been. He primarily plays second fiddle to Keeley, whom the writers decided needed to be involved in a love triangle. So Feely is a competent and enthusiastic fighter. He is shown to carry multiple weapons, and we see that he takes good care of them. 
He, along with his brother, seem to like playing pranks, and they are both prone to shirking their responsibilities, indicating that they are both naive and inexperienced relative to the rest of the party. Feely prioritizes his brother's safety over helping Thorin retake Erebor. He is shown to be selfless, has a very clear moral compass, and yet he is also occasionally very reckless with other people's lives. He is an expert on all things related to keys and doors, although he tragically misses out on witnessing the key being used to open the door, and he ultimately dies through no fault of his own after being sent scouting by Thorin. Zack says, I think Feely is inoffensive. Him being a knife guy is kind of funny, but there's not much beyond that. Yeah, you're not wrong. Mega Hobbit says, I honestly like Feely more than Keely. Absolutely, yes. More than 50% of you guys are saying uh, mostly functional. So I'm going to go with the flow here and we're going to put him in mostly functional. Next is Dwalin, who appears for 31 minutes. Dwalin, like Dane, is a dwarf through and through, and he is very effective as a static side character. He does not play a crucial part in the narrative, he does not have any kind of arc, he is simply a hardened warrior who primarily serves to allow for character development of Thorin and Bilbo. Dwalin is very intimidating and blunt, and he seems to have a close kinship with Dane, and he has zero patience for Bilbo on account of him being seemingly useless. He is notably the first dwarf to arrive at Bilbo's house, suggesting that he is extremely singular in his purpose, and he is very direct in his actions. Dwalin is a brave and very capable fighter, frequently shown to be leading the charge into combat, and he is always ready to protect Thorin either physically or through his words. And he also reacts more emotionally than the other dwarves when he is unable to do so. As a side note, I found some footage of a scene that was filmed but never included as a part of either cut of the film, in which Dwalin desperately fights his way through the orcs to get to Thorin during his duel with Azog, and he reacts accordingly when he fails to get there in time. The mind boggles as to why this was not included, as in both released cuts of the film, Dwalin seems to simply disappear at Ravenhill until after Thorin has died. Anyway, Dwalin does not appear to care about money whatsoever, which further indicates that his life is absolutely dedicated to fighting his enemies and defending his king. He speaks his mind, has a short temper, and is shown to be suspicious of Bilbo after he escapes from the Goblin Tunnels, suggesting that Dwalin has trouble understanding any tactic other than brute force. Ultimately, however, despite his dedication to Thorin, he declares that he is unwilling to follow a madman. And this confrontation is what causes Thorin to reassess how crazy he is. Dwalin is very similar as a character to Dane, and although both are very much static characters, they are very clearly defined and remain consistent throughout the trilogy. So you guys overwhelmingly are saying that he is good? I personally would be putting him in excellent. Melanistic Yemen says he's very memorable as the angry one and he has a great line about Thorin being his king. Yes. Excellent badass cool characterization played awesomely by McTavish. Arthur says Dwalin is good but doesn't get to use his character for anything meaningful and so doesn't justify excellent. Maybe even inoffensive. The problem is you can make that argument for Dane. Yeah so Dwalin as I explained he's not particularly consequential but everything he does it completely lines up with who he is as a person. Zack says he functions pretty much perfectly in his role as the strong fighter dwarf and the confrontation scene with Thorin is excellent. Yep, I am going to go with good, but he's at the top of good. Next, we have Feely's brother, the infamous sex pest Keely, who appears for 36 minutes and 30 seconds. Keely's arc seems to be that he goes from being very naive and eager to go on an adventure to someone who finds true love and then dies to save it. In principle, there is nothing wrong with this. The problems, as ever, are in the execution. Keely is shown to be very messy and disrespectful. He is consistently very reckless, which directly leads to him being badly wounded, but he continues to try to be of use to Thorin despite being injured. Keely thinks he is a ladies man but is seemingly insecure about his romantic disposition. He clearly cares about what the other dwarves think of him, indicating that he is out to prove himself, and he is also disgusted by the idea of other people fighting his battles for him. Despite his feelings for Tauriel, he ultimately prioritizes his loyalty to Thorin over his desire to delve into her depths, which is reinforced by his apparent admiration for his uncle. Keeley is, again, a very simple character with a very simple arc. His purpose in this story is to be the sexy one and to become involved in a tragically doomed love story. If the love story were more fleshed out, less cheesy and less cringeworthy than it is, I would have a much better view of Keeley as a whole. Ultimately, however, his expansion as a character serves mainly to detract from the core narrative 
and functions primarily as bloat. Fractal Face says, Keely the heartthrob, glamorous, charming rogue with absolutely nothing dwarfish about him, dwarf, central to an absolutely cringe love triangle. Did he stumble in from a different movie? You have summed it up better than I could. Pebble Institute says, I feel like Keely is brought down more by the surrounding cringe than by his character writing. I think I agree with that. His, his writing and his dialogue is absolutely cringe and everything he does that's related to the love triangle is cringe, but cringe on its own isn't bad. It's, it's cringe. It's different. Um, bad, bad, bad. Sounds like we're going bad. Okay, Keely, you've been a bad boy. And finally, for the secondary dwarves, we have Balin, who appears for 40 minutes and 15 seconds. Balin is mostly excellent. He is shown to be friendly and polite, and we learn that he highly values peace. Like his brother Dwalin, he does not particularly care for wealth, and like Dwalin, he is extremely loyal to Thorin. It is implied that Balin and Thorin have had the longest kinship, as Balin is the only member of the company that we see in any of the flashback sequences. It is also implied that Balin was aware that Azog had survived the Battle of Moria, but the fact that he elected not to tell Thorin suggests that he is willing to deceive his king if he deems it necessary. This is further reinforced later in the trilogy when he advises Bilbo not to reveal that he has the Arkenstone, as he feels it will exacerbate Thorin's madness. Balin is shown to be scholarly and practical, and is skilled at building trust and negotiating. He is also shown to be compassionate, however, like all of the dwarves, he does not seem to have any comprehension that what happened to Lake Town was entirely as a result of their actions. However, as this criticism applies to all of the dwarves, and as this comes about as a result of poor storytelling, I can't be too hard on Balin specifically. Bryce Emmons says, Balin is good counsel to both Thorin and Bilbo. That is true, because he does serve that purpose to multiple characters. Hans says, Wise and with a kick ass dwarfish beard. Approved, yes. Robin Moore says, Excellent. Film Guy says, Balin is definitely the best dwarf. Balin is supposed to be the wisest of the group, short of Gandalf, so I'm hardest on him for not feeling responsible for unleashing Smaug on Lake Town. The problem with him not feeling any guilt about what happened to Lake Town is a fault of the writing in general, not a fault of the writing with specific regard to uh, Balin. That's not really that much of like a band-aid on Balin as a character, but maybe it stops him from being perfect. It would drag him down to excellent. But I do absolutely take your point. Uh, that problem will affect Balin more than it will affect Dory or someone. Anyway, we talked about Balin for a little bit, so you guys are basically all saying excellent, and I think I'm willing to put him in excellent. That's, uh, that is fair. So that covers all of the dwarves, excluding Thorin, and in most cases they have been characterized very sparsely, usually opting for a single character trait so that the audience can tell them apart on a superficial level. Oh my god. Ori Dori Nori Biffa Bomba Biffa Bomba Loin Oin Nori Dori Nori. This is a nightmare. I can never remember. See, that's the problem. You can't even remember who they are. One of the scary things about adapting The Hobbit is the fact there's 13 dwarves. And differentiating those characters was important. In the book, it's really only three or four of the dwarves that are kind of expanded in any real way. Gimli in the first film has a very distinctive look, but when you have 13 dwarves in scenes, if, if they all look the same, it's going to be very difficult for the watching audience. We have the paternal one, the morally dubious one, the medic, the brain damaged one, Gimli's dad, the autistic one, the fat one, the one with all the weapons, the warrior, the sexy one, and the old one. Their accents are honestly all over the place. Richard Armitage and Adam Brown are both English, Ken Stott and Graham McTavish are Scottish, James Nesbitt and Aidan Turner are Irish, and the remaining seven dwarves are all played by actors who are from New Zealand, and some of them hide this very distinctive accent better than others. This disparity of accents may seem appropriate given that the dwarves live all over the place and don't currently have a home, a primary theme of the films. However, all 13 of them either lived in Erebor prior to Smaug's attack or are descended from families that did. Some of this does require knowledge of the source, so going purely from what we see in the film, we simply have to accept that the disparity of their accents is due to the fact that Thorin assembled a party of dwarves from all over Middle-earth, regardless of whether they had any personal stake in Erebor. Finding the dwarves is a massive task. There's a worldwide search. The right person for the right job it doesn't matter where they come from. This would be a very strange oversight given the extensive amount of time spent tailoring the dwarves' movements, fighting styles, singing, and use of language. Maybe this was an intentional change. Maybe the filmmakers wanted to depart from the books in order to give a sense that the dwarves were truly scattered so as to then be united by Thorin. But this doesn't entirely work because from what the films tell us, the dwarves that were scattered were the dwarves of Erebor, who then went on to live in the Blue Mountains. Living with the same group of people in a different location for 150 years is not a particularly watertight explanation for the disparity of dwarvish accents, so my guess is that this was an oversight. 
And finally, with regard to the dwarves, their finalized designs are incoherent, which was not the case earlier in production. Aiden Turner first read for an elf. If there was a boy band in uh, in Middle Earth, he would be he would be, he would be the leader Williams. of the Robbie Williams yeah. of, uh, of, yeah. of the dwarf band. world. Maybe six or seven different designs for Bomber, or six or seven different designs for Balin. You know, they just try different things. Ori, for the most part, Ori is a total miss. This guy's a comedy dwarf, okay? You know, this yeah. guy's a mum mummy's boy. I just thought it would be cool to have a broken orc axe embedded in one of their heads. It's ridiculous, but part of that appealed to me. I mean, uh, you know, to me, there is a, um, a, a, you know, a childish charm about the dwarves, particularly in The Hobbit. I mean, that's kind of where it came from. It's just something that's rather silly. Tolkien described Thorin as having a forked beard that he tucked into his belt. We have had to depart from that. I know this is controversial because the king of the longbeards, people feel he should have a long beard, but there was something I found to sort of ease my conscience a bit. It's in The Hobbit that when the dwarves emerged from Erebor, they had singed beards, so the reason Thorin wears his beard short has been reverence to those dwarves that had died in the mountain. Oin, Gloin, Dwalin, and Balin absolutely look like the dwarves of Middle-earth, and seeing them in a flashback in The Lord of the Rings would not be jarring in the slightest. Boffer, Feely, and Dory look vaguely dwarfy in that I could be convinced that they are maybe a different type of dwarf, or that they are from some totally different part of Middle-earth or something. Meanwhile, Bomba and Biffa look like cartoon characters, Ori looks like Simple Jack, and Keely looks like Viggo Mortensen's stunt double. We have now reached the top three. Gandalf appears for 1 hour, 18 minutes and 30 seconds, which is just three minutes shy of his screen time in The Lord of the Rings. Gandalf is quite unfortunately a casualty of this trilogy. Much of his characterization is in line with what we already know about him. However, more than one of his decisions are quite simply bafflingly stupid. So, Gandalf is playful, embellishes stories, and enjoys playing word games. He appreciates the simpler things in life, like smoking and drinking, and he states outright that he believes simple acts of kindness are what keep evil at bay. He is manipulative, although he only ever manipulates to serve the good of Middle-earth rather than his own interests. This is evident by his omission that Azog is alive, as well as the entire nature of his plan to retake Erebor. Gandalf is highly motivated to push Bilbo out of his comfort zone, even going so far as to do the spooky voice thing from Fellowship to declare... <laughs> He seems to want Bilbo to embrace what Gandalf considers to be Bilbo's true self, and to reinvigorate his life with a sense of wonder and purpose. He is extremely confident in Bilbo's ability, frequently reassuring the dwarves of Bilbo's usefulness. Gandalf also wants to help Thorin reclaim his home, although his reasons for doing this are either confusing or complex, depending on your perspective, and I will explore this when I come to the plot section of this video. Despite his investment in both Bilbo and Thorin, Gandalf is shown to prioritize his duty as protector of Middle-earth over anyone's individual safety. However, he is also shown to prioritize the individual safety of Thrain over his duty as protector of Middle-earth. Gandalf's claimed reason for helping Thorin is that he does not want to risk Smaug siding with Sauron. This establishes Gandalf as being highly cautious and wary of Sauron, which is at odds with his seeming indifference, at Bilbo suddenly finding a magic ring. Gandalf is also reckless, although when I say reckless I don't mean to lump him in with characters like Keeley or Dwalin. When I say Gandalf is reckless, what I mean to say is that he is suicidal. Gandalf is a careless maniac who will willingly walk into obvious traps for absolutely no reason. He also knows Bilbo has a magic ring, and yet he asks Alfred to make sure he doesn't leave despite knowing Bilbo can turn invisible, a decision which nearly leads to Bilbo's death. Gandalf also orchestrates Thorin's return to Erebor despite being very aware of the evils of gold, the moral dubiousness of which is never explored whatsoever. Gandalf's explanation of Sauron's evil plan is utter nonsense, and yet neither the filmmakers nor the other characters present seem to be at all aware of this. Gandalf is one of the most iconic characters of all time, and it pains me to say that the longer we spent with him in this trilogy, the further he strayed from being the character we know. Most, if not all, of Gandalf's moments of questionable intellect are in scenes that were created or expanded in an effort to stretch the story of The Hobbit into something that it is not. 
if those extra scenes were dispensed with, the inconsistencies of Gandalf would be disposed of alongside them. Justin says his writing comes dangerously close to breaking the Lord of the Rings trilogy more than once. I don't disagree with that. Monkey Man Matt says he is one of the worst written characters in these movies. He constantly puts himself in danger without forethought and puts the entire world at risk multiple times. That pretty much sums up my thoughts on him, and given that those are my thoughts on him, I can't I can't put him any higher than bad. Mega Hobbit says he is one I will argue actually breaks the movies. At the first movie, not so much, but the moment he goes to the subplot, it starts shaking the stand his standing a lot. Yep. Rob says he's a different character. This Gandalf is bad. He's very close to being awful. A few good scenes does not make up for hideous decisions that are contrary to his character. And Nihilist says he has nonsensical motivations. And what you guys are saying pretty much is in agreement with me. I think Gandalf is a bad character in The Hobbit. The character with the second highest amount of screen time is Thorin Oakenshield, with 1 hour 31 minutes and 45 seconds. This is one minute less than Sam had in The Lord of the Rings. Thorin is incredibly important to the narrative flow of this trilogy. He is in many ways the protagonist of the story, whereas Gandalf and Bilbo only facilitate Thorin's quest. Let's start with Thorin's positive traits. He is a very brave warrior who wants to reclaim his home. He highly values combat skills and his core principles are loyalty and honor. He personally risks his life on multiple occasions to save the other members of his party. He is an inspirational leader, he is skilled at playing crowds, and he clearly knows his dwarves very well. As in one instance, he immediately knew Gloin was the one to not contribute to the fund to pay Bard. He cares deeply about his people, is remorseful after he recovers from dragon sickness, and he is eventually willing to die in order to ensure that Azog is defeated. He places a high amount of trust in Gandalf, even in instances where he does not agree with him, such as the decision to hire Bilbo. Thorin is nonetheless suspicious of Gandalf's motives, however he seems willing to look past this, given that Gandalf is helping him achieve his own goal. He generally respects and trusts Gandalf's advice, however he also decides to enter Erebor without Gandalf due to the time constraints and given that Gandalf had clearly been delayed. Now on to Thorin's less positive traits. He is extremely stubborn and he doesn't appear to care if his words offend people. He also frequently blames entire races for the failings of one individual. He hates elves because Thranduil didn't help his people, he hates orcs because Azog killed his grandfather, and he hates or at least blames men because Girion failed to kill Smaug. He also frequently reacts emotionally rather than practically, indicating that he can be very hot-headed. The most egregious example of this is when Thranduil offers to let Thorin go, provided Thorin promises to return the gems to him. Instead of accepting, being released, and continuing with his quest, he says, fuck you Thranduil, I can't trust you, even though Thranduil's deal requires that Thranduil do Thorin a favour first, and that Thorin then return the favour later. Thorin does not need to rely on Thranduil to uphold anything, and so Thranduil's trustworthiness is irrelevant. If Thorin accepted Thranduil's deal, he literally has nothing to lose. It is possible that this is a deliberate attempt to show that at this point Thorin will absolutely not respect Thranduil, but the way it is written instead makes Thorin look like an overly emotional idiot. Due to the nature of some of the extended cartoon chase sequences, Thorin also appears to have insane plans that rely on blind luck, and occasionally is depicted as being outright unkillable. He also decides inexplicably to remove all of his armor before charging into battle, and he evidently asks the others to do the same, before telling his two nephews to split up and scout ahead, resulting in the rather predictable deaths of all three of them. Actually, why why did they do that? You know, it wasn't real armor, it was lightweight. But it, it wasn't lightweight. And of course, this was originally the armor that we were going to do the battle in. I couldn't have fought in it. Whoa. <laughs> no, he's got a lot. Doesn't look restricted at all, does it? Couldn't actually lift a weapon. Be like, trying to fight. Couldn't lift your arms above your head. And it quickly became apparent that this was not going to be practical. It was a great day on set when the decision came that the dwarves were going to shed their armor. I understood that we needed to see our dwarves that we'd followed for the entire journey and burying them in armor where you really only see this part of them was a little bit unsatisfying. They knew that what they were going into when they left Erebor to join the battle was essentially a suicide mission. And so why do they need to wear all this protection? It's just gonna slow them down. What? Anyway, Thorin inexplicably seems to believe that Bilbo did not do anything to help during the troll encounter, despite the fact that Thorin would be very aware of the fact that Bilbo's actions absolutely saved lives. He also inexplicably blames Bilbo for nearly dying as a result of the mountain coming alive. 
Thorin is occasionally shown to be an idiot, usually when he acts as one of the dwarves rather than as an independent agent. He appears to be suicidally hell-bent on killing Azog at one point, indicating that he cares more about vengeance than about the lives of his friends or retaking his home, which is simply a blatant contradiction of his core motivation. Thorin's namesake is also very confusing. We can assume, whilst watching the first film, that he took the name Oakenshield from the Oaken Branch that he used to defend himself from Azog during the Battle of Moria. The problem is that in the second film, Azog refers to Thorin as Oakenshield, and it certainly seems rather odd that Azog would choose to refer to Thorin by the utensil that he used to best him in battle, but if that wasn't enough, we also have Smaug referring to Thorin by the name Oakenshield. If only to see Oakenshield suffer. We can maybe juggle our way out of the Azog contradiction, but there is no juggling out of the Smaug contradiction. The fact that Smaug refers to Thorin as Oakenshield means that at the point in time when Smaug attacked Erebor, 150 odd years prior and before the Battle of Moria, Thorin's name was Thorin Oakenshield. The only way this can make any sense is if the dwarf whose name is Oakenshield just so happened to use an Oakenshield to defend himself in battle, which certainly reminds me of a certain character from Rings of Power who does what he does because his name means that he loves elves. Anyway, the three most prominent developments for Thorin are his friendship with Bilbo, his succumbing to dragon sickness, and his relationship with elves. With regard to Bilbo, when Thorin first meets him he chastises Bilbo, believing him to be useless. He also does not particularly trust or value Bilbo, nor does he care for his safety. After Bilbo reveals that he escaped Goblin Town on his own, Thorin is reservedly impressed by Bilbo's bravery and commitment. Thorin at this point realizes that he may have misjudged Bilbo, and he gives him the chance to earn his respect, which Bilbo does soon afterwards during the confrontation with Azog. And from this point on, dragon sickness aside, Thorin and Bilbo's friendship has been fully developed and will remain in stasis until the end of the trilogy, meaning that one of Thorin's two major developments is fully resolved in under 15 minutes. By the end of the first film, you needed to feel that Bilbo was one of them. No. Nope. The decision to accelerate Thorin's acceptance of Bilbo very likely came about as a result of stretching the latter half of this story into two movies and the decision to expand the importance of the dragon sickness subplot. Speaking of, the dragon sickness development is also extremely quick, overcomplicated, and is resolved through no particular means other than that Thorin wanted to not be crazy anymore. Throughout his descent into madness, we see that his love of gold grows. We see that he trusts but also doesn't trust Bilbo. We see him directly act in a dishonorable manner, and he also behaves irrationally to the point of absurdity. There isn't much to draw on in terms of character during these scenes, nor is there anything to make of his sudden reprieve from his madness beyond that he didn't want to be crazy anymore. Finally, regarding his relationship with elves, this one is relatively subtle, but is developed rather well. Initially, Thorin despises elves for a perfectly valid reason. His first step towards accepting elven culture is his use of the elven blade Orchrist, indicating that Thorin is willing to approach the use of elven weapons pragmatically after a nudge from Gandalf. He later seems cordial with Elrond, silently accepting Elrond's blessing, and after another nudge from Gandalf he ultimately allows Elrond to look at the map. We later have the action scene in which Thorin saves Legolas's life, when Legolas was at this point actively trying to capture him in order to imprison him for a hundred years. And in the final film, Legolas returns the favour, and in so doing returns Orchrist to him, allowing Thorin to defeat his nemesis whilst wielding an elven blade. I like this arc quite a bit because it is very gradual, we only get small bits and pieces of it every now and then, and it never feels like it is forced into a story in which it does not belong. So, Thorin is absolutely a mixed bag of a character. Much of his characterization is rushed, and some of it is simply incomplete, such as the fact that he never learns that Thrain was indeed still alive, nor does he ever learn of his fate in Dol Guldur. He primarily suffers from being forced to act like a clown whenever the dwarves do something collectively, as well as from the inanity of the dragon sickness subplot that the writers thrust upon him. However, when the writers allow him to be coherent, Thorin Oakenshield is occasionally a compelling protagonist. It's really unfortunate because, again, in the M4 book edit that removes all of the bullshit, I fucking love Thorin. Everything in the M everything in the M4 book edit that I adore about Thorin is in the Hobbit trilogy. It's just diluted with bullshit, which is why it's so annoying. 
Zach says his highs are really high and his lows are really low. That is a perfect way to put it, yes. Evie says, I think Thorin could have been great, but the Dragon Sickness plot really drags his character down, in my opinion. Absolutely, yes. JH says, completely ruined. His psychosis was the reason why three armies were fighting each other. The payoff, he has a vision of sinking into gold. Okay, I'm good now. Thanks. Ring a bell. Let's fight. Yep, pretty much. And Fractal Fae says, Thorin started off so well, but became worse the longer it went. His best scenes were great, powerful, charismatic, deep, but curing himself of madness and single-handedly winning the battle was terrible. I would put Thorin in bad because I don't think he's terrible. There is an argument that he breaks the films. I'm not sure I want to put... No, no. I definitely don't want to put him on the same tier as the Halbrand, Isildur, and Elrond from Rings of Power. So I'm going to put him in bad. I don't think he's mostly functional. I think he's barely functional and therefore bad. And finally, Bilbo Baggins clocks in at two hours and nine minutes, just 11 minutes shy of Frodo in The Lord of the Rings. Bilbo's character arc exemplifies two of the primary themes of the trilogy, the desire for a home and bravery. At the start of the film, Bilbo is a typical hobbit, although we hear it implied that when he was a child he was far more adventurous. Bilbo dislikes the idea of thrills, and he is seemingly content with living a simple life. He is timid, he is always on time, and he likes keeping to himself. Until a certain wizard arrives and whisks him away on a magical journey. Upon meeting the dwarves, Bilbo is extremely patient and polite even when they are trashing his house, and he is very nervous and uncomfortable with their boisterous behaviour. Bilbo clearly does have a repressed desire for adventure, however, as he of course decides to join the dwarves and Gandalf on their quest. He is not accepted at first, but after proving his usefulness to the party, he is embraced as one of them. Throughout the films, he gradually becomes more assertive, and he repeatedly demonstrates his extreme levels of bravery and loyalty. He becomes increasingly more comfortable with violence, ultimately taking part in the Battle of the Five Armies, when he could very easily have fled. He is also willing to be the hero Thorin needed by betraying him in order to try to save him. Bilbo does occasionally doubt himself, he also sometimes speaks without thinking, and although he takes pity on Gollum after seeing his pain and suffering, he ultimately decides to keep the ring, either because he considered it useful as it makes him invisible, or because he didn't want to risk Gollum using it to kill him. Or potentially, of course, because the ring has a mind of its own. Now onto the more confusing parts of Bilbo's characterization. Bilbo, like most other characters, seems to be indestructible until the plot decides that he is not. He repeatedly fails to use the ring to escape danger or to rescue others when he easily could have. He is also occasionally needlessly reckless and cocky, opting to taunt his enemies before he kills them. Regardless, Bilbo is for the most part a functional protagonist. His characterization is clear, as is his development throughout the trilogy. Unfortunately, his relationship with Thorin is extremely rushed, which meant that in the second and third films, Bilbo frequently took a back seat to the other characters. In The Desolation of Smaug in particular, Bilbo barely has any character development, and he simply rescues the dwarves every now and then. There are a handful of contradictions to his character, but one of the biggest crimes of these films is that they repeatedly divert the focus away from The Hobbit and onto things like romantic melodrama, massive battle sequences, and childish jokes. JSM, Bilbo was perfectly cast, i.e. regardless of my view on the character, I think Martin Freeman did a fantastic job, yes. Samson says, the only thing dragging Bilbo down is the fact that the films forget he's the titular character. Yes, there's that. That is, that is definitely a factor. Lim Lath says, Bilbo is the only character who maintained mostly consistent characterization. The changes from book to film are actually decent ones, and I love Martin Freeman. Of the three main characters, he's absolutely the best. Inglorious Baxter says he's one of the only characters that feels consistent between the two trilogies. It, do it does feel like the same person. I would give Bilbo perfect if I could. He has the most screen time of any character, and yet he only has one to two bad moments and makes the best scenes, including the beginning and the end. Given that we have Dwalin, Thranduil, Smaug, and Elrond in good, we're going to put Bilbo in good. The fact that he's this high, I think, really is a testament to why so many people still like the Hobbit movies and can enjoy them, is because Bilbo, the main character, if we're, if we're ejecting Thorin, He's good. He's a solid character. He's a very solid protagonist. Okay, so those were the characters present in The Hobbit. As with the Rings of Power autopsy, I have some numbers that I may as well show you, as I found them rather interesting. So here we have the total screen time. You can see, uh, of course, Bilbo has a huge amount more than anyone else. Thorin and Gandalf are just behind, and then there is a massive drop-off. And then once we get past Boffer, the, uh, all, most of the dwarves, Smaug, Tariel, and the various elves, they all have relatively similar levels of screen time. And then everything falls off majorly between Thranduil and Azog. 
I also made this graph here, which highlights uh, quite clearly a segment of the screen time graph. We have the 12 dwarves other than Thorin, and uh, this is their screen time uh, in Unexpected Journey, Desolation of Smaug, and Battle of the Five Armies. So in basically every single case, it goes down drastically. Um, the average screen time of a dwarf in the Battle of the Five Armies is under five minutes, and in particular Balin's screen time essentially falls off a cliff. Keeley's is relatively consistent throughout, but even his goes down. And finally, I have added the various Hobbit characters to my, uh, I guess, master sheet here, which includes every character from The Lord of the Rings and every character from uh, Rings of Power. I say every character. This is every character with more than 30 minutes of screen time. So right at the top, uh, obviously Frodo, Galadriel from Rings of Power, and then we have Bilbo. So those are the three protagonists, of course, have the most screen time. Thorin is down here, comparable to Sam and... I guess Aragorn, he's closer to than Gandalf. And then down here we have characters like Gollum, Legolas, and Gimli, who are approximately comparable to characters like Keeley, Balin, and Dwalin. And also because I thought, why the hell not, I added up the total screen time that the various characters get, regardless of what the series is. So Gandalf does not appear in Rings of Power. So I'm assuming that the stranger in Rings of Power is not Gandalf. I know that he is, you know that he is, but until we know, I'm not counting him. Gandalf, regardless, has the most screen time of any individual character in a Middle-earth uh, project or series. Narrowly behind him is Galadriel, and of course the vast majority of that is from Rings of Power. Then you have Bilbo and Frodo, because of course Bilbo has more screen time in The Lord of the Rings than Frodo had in the Hobbit. Uh, Elrond is also very high, and again, the vast majority of it is in Rings of Power. Sauron, exactly the same thing. Legolas and Gollums are comparable because of their appearances in The Hobbit. And uh, then the next character is Isildur, who, uh, yeah, 27 minutes in Rings of Power and two minutes in Lord of the Rings. But I'm only including characters that appear in at least two of the three projects. <laughs> Before we get down and dirty with the various plot lines present in the Hobbit trilogy, I would like to take a moment to explore the concept of character-driven narratives. Movies or stories in general will vary in how character-driven they are, but all but the most abstract stories are inherently character-driven in some way, as the characters in that story will usually be making decisions of some kind. Even in a film like Dunkirk that doesn't have much in the way of character or plot, there are still characters that make decisions that lead to future events taking place. Something like The Hobbit is absolutely character-driven. The reason everything happens is because of the decisions the characters make. And this is a factor in almost every single plot point. However, just because something is character-driven does not make it a better story, it just makes it a different story. Regardless, if the narrative progression in your story relies on the actions and decisions of the characters within it, then it is absolutely critical that these decisions are coherent, comprehensible, and are clearly drawn from the characterization of the relevant characters. For an example of a story being constructed entirely around the motivations of the characters involved, I am going to quickly reference the South Park episode Awesome-O. In this story, a mysterious robot is delivered to Butters, who is extremely happy to have a robot friend to play with. The robot is, of course, Eric Cartman in disguise, but Butters is convinced that Orsimo is a real robot. Within the first two minutes of the episode, Orsimo asks Butters to tell him his deepest, darkest secrets, which gives us an excellent motivation for why Cartman is doing what he is doing. He is playing some elaborate prank on Butters, which is absolutely consistent with his character. Butters then confesses to Orsimo about how he gets bullied by Cartman at school, which is, again, justified because Butters believes Orsimo to be his own personal robot friend. And he then goes on to declare that Cartman will never play a trick on him ever again. Cartman is about to reveal that he is inside the Orsimo robot suit, but Butters tells Orsimo that he has a video recording of Cartman dancing in his garden whilst dressed as Britney Spears that he plans to release if Cartman ever bullies him again. And so the rest of the episode involves Cartman being forced to continue pretending to be Butters' robot friend in order to acquire this video and thus avoid Butters showing anyone else. This is extremely simple and extremely clear. Everything Cartman does is motivated by his desire to not be humiliated, which also requires him to not be discovered, which leads to some fantastic comedic moments. I, I'm saving a conscious being. Fine, kill that son of a bitch. Now I can show you stupid assholes who I really am. Osimo! I am the Osimo 4000. <laughs> Much of the comedy comes from Cartman's terrible acting, the extreme lengths he will go to in order to avoid being discovered, 
and the fact that Butters is entirely oblivious to what is going on. The story cannot take place without Cartman having this motivation. Of course, the plot of the Awesomeo episode of South Park is substantially shorter and less complex than the Hobbit trilogy or the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which means there are inevitably far more moving parts in the form of characters and their actions that can become a failure point in these more complex stories, unless the writers have a very clear idea of what they are doing. If your characters are going to drive your plot, their reasons for doing so need to be coherent and explicable. If they are not, then the story essentially amounts to random bullshit happening because the writers said so. In order to properly explain the good and bad parts of the plot of The Hobbit, I have prepared a flowchart that I will get to momentarily. This will hopefully make clear that although there are absolutely shortcomings in the plot department, there is actually quite a lot in here that is justified by the characters in question, and does therefore make narrative sense. This is in stark contrast to the plot of Rings of Power, in which of the 58 major plot points in season 1, only 5 of them function without some manner of contrivance, convenience, plot hole, or baffling character decision getting in the way. With The Hobbit, there are 51 major plot points, and 23 of them are free from any kind of criticism. As the plot issues are nowhere near as pervasive nor are they as egregious as those in Rings of Power, I have streamlined the flowchart this time around. Green Arrow means narrative progression is perfectly functional, it makes sense, and it happens because the world and characters react as they should. Yellow Arrow means the narrative progression is contingent upon some extremely good or bad luck, or on intelligent characters being idiots. The story is still functional, as good luck, bad luck, and stupid people are all possible within a given story, however the story is certainly damaged exponentially the more of these problems there are. Red Arrow means the story has broken, something impossible has happened, and everything that happens from this point onwards relies on this impossible occurrence. Okay, so we'll start off with the mainline plot, which is Thorin retaking Erebor. Ignore the colour of the individual squares here, I did them green so that they uh, are obviously different to all of the others. The colour of the arrow is the important bit. So Smaug attacks Erebor, that makes sense. The dwarves fight the orcs in the Battle of Moria, Thror is killed and Thrain goes missing. That all makes sense, we can ignore this yellow line that goes over there, we will get to that later. The dwarves flee to the Blue Mountains, that makes perfect sense. Years later, Thorin goes looking for Thrain but fails to locate him. So this relies on someone thinking they saw Thrain, telling Thorin, but being mistaken. Because of course at this point Thrain is in Dol Guldur. That is absolutely reasonable, that could absolutely happen, and Thorin going out looking for his father is entirely in character. A group of bandits track Thorin, this is when he's in Bree, but they fail to kill him. Uh, this is reliant on Gandalf showing up precisely when he means to, given that Gandalf is Gandalf, this does have precedent, and when we get to Gandalf's motivations, this is reinforced. Again, ignore here the Gandalf plot, which is continuing with the Thorin plot, so Gandalf arrives when he means to and meets him in Bree. Gandalf orchestrates a plan to help Thorin retake Erebor. This requires that Gandalf is attacked by random bandits and recovers their orders written in black speech, because this is the leverage Gandalf uses to convince Thorin that he has to retake Erebor now. And this is entirely as a result of a random occurrence because these bandits were not looking for Gandalf, they were looking for Thorin. So why they attacked Gandalf, I... It just, they just did. Okay, Thorin meets with the emissaries from the other dwarven kingdoms and they refuse to help. This requires that the dwarves are unwilling to aid Thorin, which makes complete sense because Thorin does not have the Arkenstone. They do not recognize that Thorin is the king, and this is why Thorin's mission is to reacquire the Arkenstone so as to then convince them to come and help him defeat Smaug, which ends up not being necessary, but anyway. So the party then recruits Bilbo and they depart from the Shire. This requires that Gandalf wants Bilbo to accompany them. It requires that Bilbo is willing to accompany them, and it requires that Thorin is willing to accept Bilbo as part of the company. These are all entirely character-driven, and in the case of Gandalf, Bilbo, and Thorin, it all lines up entirely with what we know about them. Okay, Gandalf then leads them all to Rivendell in order to decipher the map. This requires that Gandalf is able to manipulate events so as to lead Thorin to Rivendell against his wishes. This is slightly problematic because Thorin repeatedly is shown to suspect that Gandalf is taking him to Rivendell, and he makes it very clear that he will not go near that place and yet Gandalf somehow manages to get them to Rivendell without Thorin actually realising. This is minor, but it does require that the world acts in a somewhat bungled way. And it also requires that Thorin is willing to allow Elrond to read the map. Given the way that scene is depicted, I think they could have done it better, but fundamentally I do believe that if Thorin believed the only way to enter Erebor was to let Elrond read the map, he would do it. 
Okay, then the dwarves cross the Misty Mountains, they escape Goblin Town, and they later escape from Azog. This all requires that Gandalf is able to locate the dwarves and teleport to them, which is something that we had never seen Gandalf do before. He just seems to suddenly have this ability, and he's just, he's there now, somehow. And also the fact that he is able to summon the eagles relies on the eagles being close by, and there also being a uh, moth that he can speak to and ask them for help, which is just luck. So, Gandalf then leads them to Bayorn's house to take refuge and ask for help. This requires that the dwarves are able to avoid both Azog's wargs and Bayorn, which, yep, yeah, sure, that's possible, I don't have a problem with that. Bayorn aids them and they reach Mirkwood. This requires that Bayorn is willing to help them. So, the problem that I have with this is that the way Bayorn is set up to behave is not the same as how he is shown to behave, which is something I elaborate on in another part of this video. So this is yellow as opposed to green, but it's a it's a minor yellow. We can say it's a shade of orange if it's not orange. I can't remember what color it is. Anyway, the dwarves are captured by spiders, but are rescued by Bilbo. This requires that Bilbo uses the ring to distract the spiders. Again, they could have portrayed it in a better way, but fundamentally, I have no problem with Bilbo doing this. The dwarves are captured by elves and are rescued by Bilbo. Bilbo is able to steal the key to the cells. That, again, I don't really have any problem with because, again, he has the ring. The dwarves are then smuggled into Lake Town. This requires that Bard is willing and able to smuggle them into Lake Town. This is in character with what we see from him. However, it also requires, thanks to the unfortunate extended scene, that the guards are unbelievably stupid. Which, yeah, sure, maybe that's possible. There's a lot of dumb characters in these films, but the only reason why they didn't get caught is because the guards were big dum-dums. Okay, the dwarves are then arrested and released. This requires that the dwarves think robbing from the armory is a good idea. I am unsure if Thorin would think this is a good idea, but you could maybe convince me that if it's his only option. This also requires that Thorin thinks bringing Keeley to rob the armory is a good idea. There is no way in hell Thorin would do this because Thorin has been told at least once, if not twice at this point, that Keeley is injured. Not only does he never check to see how injured his nephew is, he never asks Oin, the medic, to check. And even though Keeley is sort of doing his best to hide it and put on a strong face, he is, you know, he's going pale. He's very, there's very obviously something wrong with him and Thorin just doesn't care. Uh, this also requires that the master values gold over the risk of death by dragon. That is possible given that the master is an idiot, but it requires that the master is an idiot. And speaking of the master being an idiot, it also requires that the master trusts Bilbo's assessment of Thorin's character, which makes absolutely no sense. Okay, the dwarves then enter Erebor, which requires that Bilbo is able to work out the riddle. That I have no problem with. Smaug attacks Lake Town. This requires that Bilbo was unsuccessful in passing undetected, which given how intelligent and perceptive Smaug is, that lines up. It requires that the dwarves were unable to defeat Smaug. Same again, Smaug is obviously very, very big and very powerful. The dwarves defeating him was a bit of a shot in the dark. And it also requires that Smaug wants to destroy Lake Town, which he has a very clear reason to want to do that. So good job. Smaug is then defeated by Bard. This requires that Bard was able to kill Smaug. So I've put this as a green arrow because I don't have an issue with Bard being able to like make the shot as I explained previously. The problems with this scene is in how it depicts what happens, not what actually happens. Okay, afterwards, Bard attempts to negotiate with Thorin for the gold his people were promised. So this requires that Thorin is unwilling to negotiate, which I think does absolutely line up, because Thorin is at this point fucking bonkers. But it also requires that Thranduil is willing to allow a mortal to negotiate on his behalf. There are a couple of ways of looking at this. Either he's just kind of like, eh, well, maybe you can just try because why not? Like, I'll let you discover for yourself that reasoning with dwarves is a pointless thing to do. And also Thranduil, of course, highly values the lives of his elves. So on the off chance that Bard is successful, it's, it might be worth him giving it a try, I guess. And of course, actually, if, yeah, if Thranduil was there... Uh, doing the negotiating, then that would make Thor the odds of Thorin helping even lower. So I've actually just convinced myself this one's going to be green. Okay, now we have the first red. This is where the story breaks, unfortunately. So Dane attacks Thranduil's forces as they prepare to siege Erebor. This requires that Thorin was able to ask Dane for aid. This is the short bit with the raven leaving the mountain. Him being able to ask Dane for help is not necessarily a problem. Dane being willing to aid Thorin is a question mark that I think I lean on the side of that making sense rather than not making sense. However, Dane was able to muster an army and reach Erebor in a day. Because Thranduil explicitly says we attack at dawn. And we see the bird leave the previous day, meaning that Dane got everyone to Erebor from the Iron Hills in less than 24 hours, which is flatly impossible. 
Okay, the elves, dwarves, and men then battle the orcs, and this requires that all three factions consider the orcs to be the greater threat, which makes perfect sense. The company of Thorin then join the battle, saving Dane and his army. This requires that Thorin decides to stop being crazy in the space of five minutes at exactly the right time. If we're being completely technical here, this should probably be a yellow arrow, not a red one, but I don't care. I'm putting it as a red arrow. I don't care if Thorin could decide to stop being crazy. The fact that the outcome of the Battle of the Five Armies is entirely contingent upon him deciding to not be a nutcase at the right time is absolutely pathetic. So it's a red arrow, I don't care. Next up, Thorin, Feely, Keely, Dwalin, and Balin ride to Ravenhill to confront Azog. This requires that Thorin survives riding through the Orc army off screen. It's possible, because it's off screen. You just have to do more than put it off screen to convince me that it's probable. So yeah, that's a yellow arrow. Legolas then arrives and warns Gandalf and Bilbo of the Gundabad army. Bilbo decides to then warn Thorin. This requires that Legolas wanted to go to Gundabad. That is never explained by the film. This also requires that Legolas was able to travel to and from Gundabad in time. This is impossible. And this also requires that Bilbo was willing to endanger himself to warn Thorin. That is entirely in character. That makes sense. However, we have another red arrow as a result of Legolas teleporting. Okay, the orcs are defeated, but Feely, Keely, and Thorin are killed. This requires that Thorin decided to split everyone up, which is a very special decision to make, and none of the dwarves wore armor of any kind, which is another very special decision to make. Okay, the dwarves settle in Erebor. Gandalf and Bilbo travel back to the Shire. This requires that Bilbo wants to return home. Of course, he would want that. And Dane is accepted as king, which again, makes complete sense. And there we have the end of the Thorin plotline. Overall, we have two major problems. No, we have three major problems, and all of them are in the Battle of the Five Armies. Okay, I'm going to handle the other three together because they are very closely connected. So, prior to the events of the film, Sauron is defeated. Uh, Sauron then resurrects the Nazgul and summons them to Dol Guldur. This requires that the Nazgul are deceased, which contradicts information that we had in The Lord of the Rings, and it requires that necromancy is possible, which is extremely vaguely explained in this film. Hence, Yellow Arrow. Okay, Sauron captures Thrain from over here and tortures him for information. This requires that Sauron wanted information and we have no idea what Sauron knew or what information he could have possibly wanted from Thrain. So that's a big question mark. It also requires that Sauron wanted Thrain's ring, but why he wanted Thrain's ring is never explained. And it requires that Azog did not kill Thrain, which means that he had orders to not kill Thrain, which I'm not entirely sure I believe that he would follow those orders given his objective. Okay, Sauron then, again prior to the events of the film, promises Azog that he will let him kill Thorin, and Azog begins the hunt. This requires that Sauron and Azog both want Thorin dead, which makes complete sense. Someone, possibly Azog, places a bounty on Thorin's head. This requires, again, that Sauron and Azog both want Thorin dead, which makes complete sense. This group of bandits then, uh, acting on this bounty, attack Gandalf. And this requires that these bandits are cataclysmically retarded and that Gandalf is obscenely lucky to be attacked by them in the first place. If this didn't happen, Thorin would not have attempted to reclaim Erebor. So whilst that's possible, it is unbelievably lucky. Okay, going down, down, down to Goblin Town. Sauron spreads evil in the Greenwood, which attracts Radagast's attention. This requires that Sauron is either an idiot or that he wants to be discovered. Meanwhile, Azog successfully tracks Thorin. This requires that Azog is able to track him while having a vague idea of where he is and what his goals are, because, as was made clear eventually, Azog did know exactly what Thorin was trying to do, so him being able to locate him I don't have a problem with. Okay, now we have more question marks. These arrows are not meant to be darker, they're meant to be yellow, so apologies for that. So, Radagast follows the evil spiders to Dol Guldur and discovers Sauron and is able to escape. This requires, once again, that Sauron wants to be discovered or is an idiot. So, another question mark. Azog sends out word that there is a bounty on Thorin's head again, because if you recall, there were two bounties that were sent out within a short period of time. This requires that Azog forgot about the first bounty. So, question mark? I mean, we know why they did it. It was so that they could tell us that there was a bounty before showing us the flashback in Bree. But either way, it's weak. Now we uh, get over here to Radagast informing Gandalf of the presence of a necromancer. This requires that Sauron and the Witch King reveal themselves to Radagast, that Sauron allows Radagast to escape. Both of those are big question marks, but they don't break anything because it is possible that Sauron is again an idiot or that he wants to be discovered. The bit that breaks everything is that Radagast is able to locate Gandalf. There is no possible way that he could have done this. 
And yes, in film three, we do see that Gandalf and Radagast are able to communicate in some way telepathically. However, at this point, Gandalf is much further away than he is from Radagast in film three. And also, Gandalf is very surprised to see Radagast and does not know why he's there when he arrives, meaning that Gandalf could not have been communicating with him and telling him, come find me here. Anyway, moving on. So, Gandalf fails to convince the White Council of any impending threat. This requires that Gandalf forgets information that he knows could be convincing, and it requires that no other characters challenge Saruman on his ridiculous assertions. These are both very confusing decisions, but, I mean, sure, it's possible that they're all just weird and they don't communicate like people, so it's a yellow arrow, not a red one. Azog receives a message from the Great Goblin and was able to follow Thorin. This requires that the message reaches Azog before Thorin could escape. This is a bit of a stretch, but because we don't know how many wheelie boys there are, it's possible they had like a production line of them, and they managed to get the message to Azog before Thorin escaped and flew away. Okay, Azog then fails to kill Thorin. This is entirely contingent on Gandalf summoning the eagles, which I've already been into. Bolg tracks Azog and tells him to return to Dol Guldur. This doesn't make any sense because Bolg is able to locate Azog without having a clue where he is. This is relatively minor in the grand scheme of things, but either way, I don't consider this to be a possibility. And had this not happened, then the entire party would have been run down by Azog the day after. And here we have Sauron summons Azog and orders him to lead his armies. This requires that Bolg was able to locate Azog before Sauron needed to march on Erebor. This is why this is a bit of a problem, because there is a time constraint on him locating Azog. And again, had this not happened, lots of people very likely would have been killed. Okay, meanwhile here, Gandalf decides to leave the party and investigate the High Fells with Radagast. This requires that Gandalf is able to communicate with Radagast so as to meet him there, this is shown to be possible in film three, so I don't have a problem with this. And it also requires that Gandalf heeds Galadriel's advice, which he would absolutely do. So I don't have a problem with this, hence Green Arrow. Okay, Azog orders Bolg to take over the hunt for Thorin. This requires that Azog prioritizes obeying Sauron over his personal quest for murder. This maybe could have been explained a little bit more, but I think we have enough. And either way, Azog seems to care about Thorin being killed rather than him personally being the one to kill him so I don't have a problem with him sending Bolg rather than refusing to obey Sauron. Okay, moving on. So, Bolg tracks Thor into the Woodland Realm and later to Lake Town. This requires that Bolg is able to travel from Dol Guldur to Bayon's house and back in a single day. This is flatly impossible. And it also requires that Bolg and his orcs are able to enter Lake Town without anyone noticing. This is definitely pushing plausibility. I don't think that this is possible, but at the same time, there only seem to be about five guards in Lake Town and they're all idiots. Okay, down here, Gandalf enters Dol Guldur alone and is captured. This requires that Gandalf is incomprehensibly reckless and idiotic. I need to say no more. Gandalf is broken at this point. Uh, Gandalf is captured here, hence the continuation of the yellow line. So, Sauron reveals his presence to Gandalf, kills Thrain, and imprisons Gandalf. This requires that Sauron does not want to kill Gandalf, or is an idiot, which, again, that's possible. The primary villain of the Lord of the Rings could be retarded. That's, that's, yeah, that's possible. Sauron also wants to kill Thrain. That's possible, but it doesn't make any sense why he chose to do it then and there. And Sauron thought a single orc would be able to retrieve Gandalf's ring. That is unbelievably stupid. There's no reason why he would think that, unless, of course, he is an idiot. Okay, continuing, we have two big, long yellow lines. So... Galadriel, Saruman, Elrond, and Radagast rescue Gandalf and banish Sauron. This requires that Galadriel, Saruman, and Radagast are able to arrive in time to save Gandalf. This is blind luck, hence yellow line. It also requires that Sauron wants to reveal his presence to them. Doesn't really make any sense, but again, he could be an idiot. And Sauron either believed he could defeat them or believed they would banish him specifically to Mordor and ask no further questions. So this probably should be a red arrow because I hate this. But technically, yeah, okay, this is only a yellow one. It's just a big fat yellow one. Okay, meanwhile, Bolg flees Lake Town and Azog orders Bolg to summon the Gundabad army. This is only possible because of the involvement that Tauriel and Legolas have in the story, all of which is contingent upon many special things happening. So an orc told Legolas and Tauriel that Kili was mortally wounded. I can understand the orc being like pure evil and being like, nyah, I've hurt one of your friends, nyah. But the way it's presented is that this particular orc attacked them on his own, uh, got captured, and then specifically said, hey, Tariel, you know that dwarf you want to boink? Well, I shot him. You better go heal him. Which is just an unbelievably contrived way to portray that. Uh, it also requires that Tariel and Legolas decide to go to Lake Town. That I can buy, given the characterization that they have at that point in time. It requires that Legolas stops chasing Bolg, or is unable to keep up, that is possible, but is never explained, so 
definitely would have preferred that it is, and it requires that the Gundabad army was not already in play, so this only really makes any sense if Sauron was just keeping the Gundabad army in his back pocket for some reason, because otherwise it would already be marching on Erebor. And uh, yeah, we don't know why that's not the case, we just have to accept that it wasn't. And then we have a nice big red line, the reason it's red is because of the means by which Legolas was able to warn Gandalf and Bilbo, which I have already been through. So that, boys and girls, is the plot of The Hobbit. And I do find it very interesting that in the numerous fan edits that I watched, which I will be getting to soon, they essentially cut out the Sauron plot, the Azog and Bolg plot, and the Gandalf plot. And we are left with the green one on the left, which is the main plot of, of uh, Thorin, which is by far the most consistent and coherent plot. And the problems with it down here, the three red arrows, you can fix very, very easily. <laughs> Dragon Sickness is a key part of the narrative in this trilogy. Unfortunately, as with many things, the filmmakers overcomplicate this fundamental idea into something that is contradictory and nonsensical. Although I am not really referencing the book, I thought it might be useful to establish what Dragon Sickness is in the novel. Here is the one mention of gold-related sickness in The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. Bilbo thought that Thorin would at once admit what justice was in them. He did not, of course, expect that anyone would remember that it was he who discovered all by himself the dragon's weak spot. And that was just as well, for no one ever did. But he also did not reckon with the power that gold has upon which a dragon has long brooded, nor with dwarvish hearts. Long hours in the past days Thorin has spent in the treasury, and the lust of it was heavy on him. Though he had hunted chiefly for the Arkenstone, yet he had an eye for many another wonderful thing that was lying there, about which were wound old memories of the labours and the sorrows of his race. This is extremely non-specific, and it is not at all necessary for the narrative progression of the story. The writers of the films, however, found themselves in need of a third movie, and so much of what happens in that third movie became entirely contingent upon Thorin being crazy in a very specific way. And the justification is that Thorin is suffering from dragon sickness. People always say, well, it's this very relatively slight novel, and so how come it's three movies? We went into the appendices, which you find at the end of The Lord of the Rings, and you learn very specifically about events that occurred in The Hobbit. We're actually expanding The Hobbit, but using Tolkien's notes in the appendices very much as our blueprint. Before I dig in, I find myself needing to make a partial correction to something I claimed in part two. After Smaug wakes, Thorin ventures inside Erebor and finds Bilbo. Where do you find it? Oh, we have to get up. Oh, oh. What exactly Bilbo is saying here fundamentally changes the nature of the first half of the Battle of the Five Armies. In the script, as well as the official subtitles for the film, Bilbo simply says, we have to get out. He does not actually provide any kind of response as to whether or not he has the Arkenstone. In this transcript of the film, however, I discovered that he supposedly says no, that he did not find the Arkenstone. To my ears, Bilbo says, yeah, in a very dismissive way, as he is obviously dodging the question and does not really want to commit either way. <laughs> this led me down a bit of a rabbit hole, one which I happily ventured down because of how absolutely critical this line is to Thorin's actions in the Battle of the Five Armies. It is entirely possible that I heard Bilbo say, yeah, because he does a little nod, leading me to believe that he had answered in the affirmative. That he does not fully articulate, yes, Thorin, I have the Arkenstone, is Bilbo's way of dismissing the question because he knows they need to escape before Smaug catches them. However, as I at this point had enough reason to doubt my own ears, I put up a poll, and although the majority of you guys think Bilbo did not answer the question, and simply grunted, there were still 80 people out of nearly 600 of you that thought he said yes. When it comes to dialogue in films, unless there is a very clear reason as to why your dialogue is inaudible or incomprehensible, this amount of disparity in the audience's understanding of the words that were said is absolutely unacceptable. I have a theory on this, however, which I will get to momentarily. The reason why Bilbo's answer here is absolutely critical to what happened in the Battle of the Five Armies is because if Bilbo claimed to have the Arkenstone, then Thorin's decision to continue looking for the Arkenstone requires that he confronted Bilbo off-screen and that Bilbo replied, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't actually find it. If Bilbo did in fact say no, then this makes significantly more sense, as this would then explain why Thorin continues to search for it in the film, and it would also suggest that Thorin's reason for drawing his blade on Bilbo is that he suspects Bilbo is lying to him. 
What it doesn't explain is at what point did Thorin decide to believe Bilbo, which would have been a very important moment for the film to explain why Thorin is doing what he is doing. If Bilbo neither said yes or no and simply made a dismissive grunt, as many of you seem to believe is what happened, then this still begs the question as to why Thorin went from being extremely suspicious of Bilbo to not being suspicious of Bilbo. If you will join me for a moment and place the tinfoil hat stored under your seat upon your head, please be sure to fit your own tinfoil oil hat first before helping others sit back and enjoy the conspiracy theory. Given the ungodly amount of tomfoolery surrounding the production of this trilogy, given that they started filming before the script was completed, and given that the fifth and final draft of the script for The Desolation of Smaug was completed three weeks before the film was released in cinemas, I do not think it outside of the realm of possibility that in the original film, when asked if he has the Arkenstone, Bilbo answered unequivocally, yes. This explains Martin Freeman giving a slight head nod, as in that take, he said, yes. In this hypothetical original version of the trilogy, everything Thorin does for the first half of the Battle of the Five Armies would no longer happen, as he would already have the Arkenstone. He would have no reason to be angry with Bilbo, and he would also be able to use the Arkenstone to do what he ends up doing later in the film anyway, in spite of its absence. This would, of course, cut down tremendously on the runtime of the Battle of the Five Armies. Now we come to the tinfoil hat part. I put it to you, dear viewer, that the production team used ADR to change Bilbo's response to Thorin's question when they realised there was going to be a third movie, thus going some way to explaining why Thorin does what he does in the first half of the Battle of the Five Armies. This is the reason why Bilbo's response sounds so unclear and weird. Given the fact that massive films of this scope are almost always shot out of sequence, it is entirely possible that this scene between Thorin and Bilbo was one of the first to be shot. I can actually do one better than entirely possible. I would consider it probable, given the insane amount of visual effects work that needed to go into creating Smaug. So as Smaug is a core component of this entire sequence, they very likely filmed the actors early on so as to give the animators enough time to work their magic. Bilbo and Thorin's growing friendship could have, and in my view should have, been a core component of the narrative. Given how the trilogy ends, it seems clear to me that this was the intent of the writers. Instead, all of their development was constrained to the first movie. This confrontation should have been a huge character moment for Bilbo. His friend and the leader of their company has just held a sword at his neck. Bilbo should be freaked the fuck out. Bilbo should take some kind of action. There should be consequences for this. In the second film, this moment was cut short by the arrival of Smaug, so I can totally accept them not hashing this out then and there. However, this was a major narrative thread that needed to be explored further. Instead of any on-screen conflict between Thorin and Bilbo as a result of this, Bilbo just kind of tells the other dwarves, oh no, something's wrong with Thorin. Pretty pathetic, huh? Anyway, onto the actual explanations the film gives for Thorin's insanity. Having now looked at all three films in detail, as well as read some very helpful comments from you guys, I think I'm happy to say that Dragon Sickness is so named because it makes you act like a dragon. It makes you covet gold, and the name Dragon Sickness has nothing directly to do with the effects of a dragon, or necessarily of the gold itself. So in principle, this is a very simple concept. Thorin suffers from dragon sickness, resulting in him falling from grace before breaking free from the sickness and redeeming himself. It may surprise you to learn, then, that the film offers four explanations for why Thorin suffers from dragon sickness. The first explanation is that the Arkenstone has a magical One Ring-like property that causes the bearer to go mad. This is directly implied by Smaug's dialogue, I am almost tempted to let you take it if only to see Oakenshield suffer. Watch it destroy him, watch it corrupt his heart and drive him mad. This is also partially supported by what happened to Thor in the prologue as he was driven mad whilst in possession of the Arkenstone. This explanation is, I think, the most coherent despite lacking any kind of explanation or justification as to why the Arkenstone has this property. The second explanation is that the Treasure Horde itself is cursed. There are multiple references that support this. Firstly, Bard states, What gold is in that mountain is cursed. We will take only what was promised to us. Bilbo also states in the Battle of the Five Armies, Having a sickness lies on it. And he is presumably referring to the gold rather than Erebor itself. And finally, Gandalf tells us, Don't underestimate the evil of gold. Gold over which a serpent has long brooded. 
implying that the gold becomes more corrupted when a dragon has been lying on it, suggesting that dragon sickness does actually have something to do with dragons. Dragon sickness seeps into the hearts of all who come near this mountain. This also implies that dragon sickness should be affecting everyone, whereas the only two people we see suffer any ill effects are Thror and Thorin. Additionally, this would not explain why Thror went mad, as he was afflicted with dragon sickness prior to Smaug's attack on Erebor. The third explanation is that Thorin's bloodline is predisposed towards insanity. This is supported by Elrond's line, A strain of madness runs deep in that family. And the fact that Gandalf does not challenge him on this assertion would suggest that Gandalf agrees. Bilbo also tells us during the prologue that It was a sickness of the mind. We also know that, unrelated to the treasure of Erebor, Thrain went mad implicitly because Thror had been killed in battle, so it is also possible that Thrain was driven mad by a combination of losing his father and as a result of his genetic predisposition towards being crazy. However, if Thorin is genetically a crazy person, then this makes the idea that he can suddenly decide to not be crazy even more absurd than it already is. Additionally, Thorin and Smaug both share the line with a single toy, not one piece of it. Which indicates that their obsession with gold is coming from either the gold itself or the Arkenstone and cannot be from Thorin's bloodline. And finally, the fourth explanation is that the Ring of Power caused the dragon sickness. This one does require us to look at the source material. This is supported by the fact that Thror bore a Ring of Power, and the fact that in the source material the dwarves were resistant to Sauron's corruption. The dwarven ring bearers became more susceptible to dragon sickness rather than becoming wraiths like the Nazgul. However, Thrain was given the ring by Thror shortly before the Battle of Moria, and it was then taken by Azog shortly afterwards, meaning that the ring cannot have been the cause of Thrain's madness. Additionally, Thorin never had a Ring of Power. He only ever interacted with the Arkenstone and the Treasure Horde, so the Ring can only be a potential explanation in the case of Thror. So in conclusion, Dragon Sickness is a very simple concept that had the potential to be effective. It is an extremely clear plot device that allows for an exploration of themes of greed, obsession, and self-destruction. Unfortunately, like many parts of this trilogy, the writers overcomplicated this idea into something that is almost incomprehensible, and they ultimately undermined the supposed symbolic importance of Thorin's affliction by having him decide to stop being a nutcase in five minutes flat. This would be far less of an issue if Thorin succumbing to dragon sickness were not absolutely pivotal to the events of the Battle of the Five Armies, both in terms of character, narrative progression, and theme. Because the writers wanted Thorin being crazy to drive the first half of the film, and because the writers wanted Thorin to redeem himself and reconcile with Bilbo before his death, they had no choice other than to make Thorin simply snap out of it, which is an extremely cheap way to tell a story. Keeley was no longer in love with Tauriel because he snapped out of it. Azog no longer wanted to wipe out the line of Durin because he snapped out of it. Gollum was no longer obsessed with the ring because he snapped out of it. Writers, you can do this, but when you do this, I get to explain in detail why you did a bad thing. Now onto some of the more general storytelling shortcomings present in the Hobbit trilogy. Some of the biggest problems with these movies are not in the story it is telling, but how it chooses to tell its story. The films are filled with cheap comedy, strange tonal inconsistencies, a metric fuck-ton of extraneous bullshit, as well as fascinating moments of unadulterated convenience. I am also going to touch on how the films perform in the theme department, which is, as one might expect, a mixed bag. <laughs> There are many types of comedy, but for the purposes of this video I want to focus on the three main types that are implemented in these films. The comedy in the Hobbit trilogy generally falls into one of three categories. Plain old dumb, comedy at the expense of characters, and functional character-driven comedy. A dumb joke can work depending on how and when it is implemented, but it risks detracting from immersion by drawing viewers out of the film as a result of the constant flip-flopping from serious moments to dumb jokes. Comedy at the expense of characters, however, is something that never works. The situational humour or the jokes themselves in the best comedy films often feel inevitable, and the reason they are funny is partly because although the punchline may be absurd or unexpected, we understand the events that got us to the punchline. 
A joke in a film also has to do more than simply be funny for it to be justified and for it to function in a story. If Frodo cracked the best one-liner that has ever been cracked right after dropping the ring into Mount Doom, it may have been the funniest thing that had ever been put to film, but it would destroy the scene for obvious reasons. For an example of what I would consider to be bad comedy, I am going to target Family Guy. I don't hate Family Guy by any means, and the earlier seasons I do still find moderately enjoyable, but many of the jokes in Family Guy are absolutely examples of poorly constructed comedy. Here are some examples from a randomly chosen episode that I had not seen prior to making this video. Are you brushing with a grill brush? I left my toothbrush at a hotel three years ago. Get out. There's a grenade in here. This is the closest I've ever been to Mr. Quagmire. He's wearing makeup. Looks like a Kirby. No one looks like a Kirby. You own a gray Honda Accord? No. Okay, good. Hi, I have your boner and butt pills from Gladiator. Forgot your box of boner and butt pills. Why was your box of boner and butt pills on the stairs? If you hold this feather, you can fly. Really? Wow, thanks, little rat. Ow! These jokes are not at the expense of the characters involved. However, they are absolutely interchangeable. They either have nothing to do with the characters involved, or there is simply no logical throughline. There is nothing to draw from the characters, as the jokes either take place in the form of isolated flashbacks, or they are in the form of random throwaway lines that have no bearing on either the plot or the characters. They could be removed entirely, and the narrative progression of the episode would remain intact. All of the punchlines are some variation of I bet you weren't expecting that, or in other words, shock comedy. This kind of thing is similar to jump scares in that they will usually work once, they take a relatively low amount of skill to create, and unless the shocking moment is implemented effectively as a part of a larger whole, the joke, or scare, will ultimately be forgotten moments later. Anyway, for an example of character-driven comedy done exceptionally well, we can look at A Fish Called Wanda. Mild spoilers, so if you want to avoid them, please click ahead to this point in the video. Three, two, one, go. So what you need to know is that Otto has just assaulted Archie, and the reason he did this is because he was jealous of Archie, believing Wanda to be falling in love with him. Wanda claims that she is playing Archie in order to acquire the MacGuffin, and that therefore, by assaulting Archie, Otto has just ruined her plan. She convinces him that the smart thing to do would be to apologize to Archie, playing into Otto's ego and pseudo-intellectualism. The end result is that Otto, very begrudgingly, decides to drive to Archie's house in order to set things right. Upon arriving, he discovers that someone is robbing the place, and so Otto apprehends the burglar, believing this to be a way of getting on Archie's good side. It turns out that the burglar is Archie, who was staging a burglary of his own house for plot-related reasons that I won't go into, and this results in a payoff that is fan-fucking-tastic. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't know it was you. How could I know it was you? Stupid jerk. I mean, what the fuck are you doing robbing your own house, you asshole? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. And shortly afterwards, Otto returns to Archie's house to apologize once again. Okay. Oh, no, no. Uh, please. Look, I want to apologize. Oh, no, you just ended it, all right? Wait, 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 I just want to say I'm sorry. Right, Honda! Shut up! Help me down! Uh, Listen! Please. No, no, that's a terrible day. Will you shut up? All of this is highly character driven, and every action that leads to a comedic payoff is thoroughly set up by the ways in which the film developed everyone's characteristics. So, to conclude on this tangent about the nature of comedy, is A Fish Called Wanda funnier than Family Guy? In my opinion, the answer is as strong of a yes as I can possibly give, but comedy is of course very subjective, so you are perfectly entitled to disagree with me. However, I will instead ask, is the comedy in A Fish Called Wanda better constructed than the comedy in Family Guy? In this case, opinions are irrelevant. We have now entered the realm of fact. One of these things is absolutely superior to the other, it is possible for a joke to be constructed, in a more or less competent manner than another joke. Back to the topic of this video, in The Hobbit, the majority of the comedy falls under what I am calling plain old dumb. 
These are the Family Guy style inconsequential funnies that are injected to make people laugh and nothing more. They do not inform us of character in any meaningful way, they are simply the film stopping in order to do a haha -ha before continuing with the story. These could all be cut and neither the plot nor the characters would change. These aren't necessarily all bad in isolation, but they contribute to a general sense of tonal whiplash resulting in a lack of immersion and believability. Made in Rivendell. No, actually, no, but, um, you can't just too, so you should come out and No one else would have the bollocks, sire. Help! <laughs> I smell a bit of dragon. It will make it clean now. I'm in the no, no, no. You leave an old woman. <laughs> we also have comedy at the expense of character. These are the most egregious jokes because in these instances the film actively damages its characters in order to try to make the audience laugh. Probably the most damaging example is when the dwarves, Thorin included, fail to realise that Bilbo is buying them time after they have all been tied up by the trolls, indicating to the audience that the dwarves and the trolls all have approximately the same level of intelligence, which of course contradicts what we already know to be the case. We also have simpler things like Oin stuffing his ear trumpet as he doesn't like elvish music when he could simply remove the trumpet from his ear, Gandalf being unable to use Radagast's staff, which indicates that he did not check if the staff was functional, and the fact that no one cared to wake Boffer in Lake Town, indicating that despite Thorin valuing all of his dwarves for their loyalty and willingness to help, he was nonetheless fully prepared to leave Boffer behind for essentially no reason. And finally, there are a couple of examples of functional character-driven comedy. This doesn't necessarily mean that I found these jokes funny, or even that these jokes are in any way complex, more so that these jokes are more than simply jokes. They either provide character development, narrative progression, thematic progression, or foreshadowing. They are purposeful, regardless of how well-crafted the jokes actually are. One example of this is Keeley accidentally being attracted to a man and then being embarrassed, and another example is Dane threatening Thranduil in a somewhat comical manner that serves as an introduction to his character. Whilst there are many, many examples of bad comedy within the Hobbit movies, there is one that I want to home in on because it is similar in terms of setup to a scene from The Lord of the Rings, but the payoff in The Lord of the Rings is fantastic, whereas the payoff in The Hobbit is, for lack of a better word, a joke. I will give you a rundown of the setups of each scene before comparing the payoffs. So the first scene I have chosen for the chopping block is the dwarves meeting Bayorn for the first time. Gandalf explains to the dwarves that they need Bayorn's help and that they need to be very careful when dealing with him. The suggestion is that Bayorn is extremely dangerous and that he does not like dwarves, and yet the dwarves have no choice but to negotiate with Bayorn for aid. Gandalf repeats to the dwarves a list of things that they absolutely under no circumstances should do. The rest of you, you just wait here and don't come out until I give the signal. No sudden moves or loud noises and don't overcrowd him. Only come out in pairs. This scene is funny, or at least it is structured so as to be funny. The purpose of this setup is to make the audience laugh, and until we get the payoff there is nothing hugely wrong with this. Now moving on to the setup for the similar scene from The Lord of the Rings. Upon arriving at Minas Tirith, Gandalf informs Pippin of Denethor, and lists things that Pippin absolutely under no circumstances should do. To give him news of his beloved son's death would be most unwise. I do not mention further. And say nothing of Aragorn either. In fact, it's better if you don't speak at all, Perkin. This setup is extremely similar. Gandalf has no choice but to speak to Denethor, and he needs Pippin to not get in the way. He very deliberately lays out the things that should not be done, and in both cases they are somewhat humorous in terms of delivery. Now, onto the payoffs. After mistaking Gandalf's gesture for the signal, despite no signal having actually been established, the dwarves do exactly what Gandalf told them not to do, and it is all one big hilarious misunderstanding. Bayorn is not happy about the fact that there were 13 dwarves hiding in his house, but it turns out he is more than willing to help them. 
Now moving back to the Lord of the Rings, whilst Gandalf attempted to preemptively control the situation by asking Pippin to remain silent and not mention Boromir, he did not foresee that Denethor would already know of Boromir's death. Pippin then does exactly what Gandalf told him not to do. Boromir died to save us. He failed defending us from many foes. Pippin! I offer you my service, such as it is, in payment of this debt. Not only does Pippin speak, but he also pledges himself to Denethor, and Gandalf does not approve of him doing this. So, both scenes feature their respective characters doing the exact opposite of what Gandalf told them to do, following a somewhat comedic setup. Why then does the Hobbit scene fail where the Lord of the Rings scene succeeds? In The Hobbit, the reason why the dwarves disobey Gandalf is because Gandalf is an idiot in that he told them to wait for the signal but did not clarify what that means, and because the dwarves, specifically Boffer, are idiots because they mistook a random hand gesture for the signal for them to all come out and greet Bayorn. The payoff for this joke requires that the characters in question are idiots and that Bayorn does not behave as he was set up to behave. In The Lord of the Rings, Pippin disobeys Gandalf not because he is an idiot, but because he feels immense gratitude for Boromir's sacrifice, and he decides to serve Boromir's father to repay this debt. This is the first time Pippin has been separated from Merry and has done something of his own accord. This is a critical moment of character development for him. Instead of letting himself be treated like a child by Gandalf, he asserts himself and offers his service to Denethor. This may not be a wise move, but it is entirely character motivated. If not for Denethor's foreknowledge that Boromir had been killed, this would not have happened. If this were any hobbit other than Pippin, this would not have happened. The reason Gandalf tells Pippin to keep his mouth shut is because we have seen multiple times that Pippin is careless and impulsive, meaning that the payoff for this scene is entirely character driven. Notice how the scene does not require that Gandalf, Pippin, or Denethor are idiots. This is how you do character writing. The scene additionally serves a purpose beyond making the audience laugh, although making the audience laugh is a part of the scene. It is extremely efficient, extremely character focused, and extremely narratively coherent. In terms of general tonal whiplash, many of the extreme cartoon physics sections can be hand waved to some degree by acknowledging that dwarves are hardier than the other races of Middle-earth, and that therefore they can fall from great heights without sustaining any injuries. However, in the first film, Bilbo is present for the thunder battle and the fall into Goblin Town, plus he also falls even further, ending up in Gollum's lair. Additionally, Gandalf is present when they fall into the cave after defeating the Great Goblin. We also have the absurd scene of Bard riding a wheelbarrow down a hill over his kids and into a troll. This means that the excuse that the dwarves are better at taking damage doesn't work, because it very much seems like exaggerated cartoon physics applies equally to everyone in Middle-earth. No one is ever injured as a result of any of this, meaning that every character, regardless of their race or power level, is effectively invincible until the film decides otherwise. The battle didn't exist in much of a form even after we did the live action filming and a lot of that was really shooting actors doing what I needed them to do for the storytelling without having a clue how exactly this was going to slot into the battle sequence. During many of the combat sequences, we also see that the dwarves are incredibly skilled in combat, efficiently defeating multiple opponents without breaking a sweat and without sustaining any injuries. We also see this degree of martial prowess coming from humans later in the series. This kind of combat effectiveness would perhaps be more in line with what we could expect from elves, but because the filmmakers decided that everyone is in practice a superhero, they then had to exaggerate the elves' combat skills even further, which is what led to some of the more questionable moments in terms of believability. We started out on The Hobbit with the intention to do, you know, a two film adaptation and it wasn't until right at the very end of principal photography of the two films that we pitched the idea to the studio that it was going to be more comfortable sitting in a three film sort of a structure. The Hobbit trilogy is probably the most bloated trilogy of movies that has ever been made. The sheer amount of meandering plot threads that actively make the film worse is incredible. Whilst not all instances of new additions are necessarily a detriment, such as the expansion of the Bard character, the 
vast majority simply make the films longer, with very little in the way of purpose. There are examples of bloat that only really serve as a waste of time, such as the addition of The Prophecy, which overcomplicates the setup of the narrative and does not have any kind of payoff later in the film, as well as the decision to keep Alfred alive after the opening sequence in the Battle of the Five Armies, which was likely done for comedic reasons, as well as the sequences in the Shire depicting Frodo. These don't necessarily damage the film outside of the effect they have on pacing, but there are a great many ways in which the films suffer directly due to the insane amount of bullshit the writers decided to add. Here are some examples. The filmmakers lent hard into the importance of the ring and frequently depicted Bilbo using it. This creates problems because of the fact that Sauron and the Nazgul are also involved in the story. The expansion upon the history and nature of the Nazgul also creates questions within the Lord of the Rings. The depiction of gigantic rock monsters that are not plot relevant when Smaug is plot critical is absurd. The living mountains are in fact never mentioned before or after they're seen, they just happen and are then forgotten. One would think these things, as well as the great Earth Eaters, would prompt just as much cause for concern as a sleeping dragon, if not more so. This was to be a sudden attack. If they don't do the sudden attack, then our heroes look like idiots. Yeah, we, we wouldn't want that, would we? The arc of Bilbo being accepted by the dwarves being entirely constrained to the first film can also be attributed to the decision to bloat the films into three. Additionally, the decision to split Azog and Bolg into two separate entities leads to multiple questionable storytelling beats, and this decision was likely made so as to give Legolas more of a purpose within the second and third films. In the books, Azog is dead by the time The Hobbit takes place, and in the script, Azog is occasionally Bolg, indicating that in the earlier stages of the film, Azog had a much smaller role if he ever appeared at all. The only main narrative beat Azog features in after the end of An Unexpected Journey is in his boss fight with Thor. So my presumption is that much, if not all, of what we see from Bolg in The Desolation of Smaug was originally intended to be for Azog, although the character would have been named Bolg. Everything relating to the Dwarven Rings of Power is absolutely an example of bloat, and it needlessly overcomplicates Sauron's plan. It also makes the White Council look exceedingly incompetent when they knowingly and willingly bring all three Elven Rings to Sauron. Probably the most obvious example of shameless bloat in these films is the love triangle. There are multiple other examples of love triangles in film, ranging from the good to the... yeah, uh, yeah. But love triangles don't need to be complex in order to function. The love triangle in Titanic is also very simple, but it is functional, mostly believable, and extremely effective. For the Keeley Tariel Legolas romance, however, in terms of setup, all we have is the scene in An Unexpected Journey, in which Keeley states that he does not find elf women attractive, as they are too thin and don't have enough facial hair. The fact that Tariel is tall, thin, effeminate, and is of course lacking in the facial hair department would suggest that his comments prior to meeting her were in fact him chatting shit so as to try and fit in with the rest of the dwarves. Tariel is initially distrustful of Keeley due to him being a dwarf, he then makes a joke about his willy, after which she indicates to Legolas that she finds Keeley attractive. We also learn that Legolas is jealous of this due to him also being attracted to Tariel, but Thranduil commands her not to pursue Legolas due to her being of a lower social status. So the building blocks here are extremely simple and involve classism, forbidden romance, and love at first sight, resulting in a love triangle. As I am not a Tolkien purist, I would have no problem with them inserting Legolas into The Hobbit, creating the character of Tariel, and manipulating a romantic subplot involving the two of them and one of the dwarves, provided it served a reasonable purpose in the story beyond, well, audiences like romance and there isn't really any romance in The Hobbit, so we gotta add some of that romance. So some of this is good, by the way. I won't. Oh, right. oh. I was making this up this morning. So what does the love triangle facilitate beyond the impacts it has on the various characters that I have already mentioned? Tariel having a connection with Keeley whilst he is imprisoned directly leads to her disobeying her king and travelling to Lake Town in order to heal him from the Morgul Shaft. Her doing this also prompts Legolas to follow her. Had Legolas and Tariel not been in Lake Town, Bard's family, as well as Keeley, and very likely Feely, Oin, and Boffa, would all have been killed by Bolg. Any of the survivors would then very likely have died when Smaug attacked Lake Town. Bilbo, Gandalf, and Thorin would not have had any warning that there was another army from Gundabad. 
I could go on, but essentially the point I'm making here is that the reason why Legolas and Tauriel play an active part in the Hobbit trilogy is because of the love triangle they find themselves trapped within. They may go on to serve narrative purposes beyond who they do and don't want to fuck, but these characters are entirely defined by the roles they play in the triangle of love. If Keeley looked like Bomber, Tauriel and Legolas would have remained in the halls of the Woodland Realm. And bringing us back to the topic of this part of the video, shoehorning a love triangle into The Hobbit is absolutely an example of bloat, as the whole thing could be removed along with many scenes that would then directly improve upon the film as a whole. <laughs> Now we are going to have a little discussion about luck. Luck is obviously a part of life. Things that happen that are lucky are things that can happen within the world the story takes place in, but are to varying degrees unlikely to occur. If I write a story about a person who wins the lottery, this is of course extremely lucky. However, if such a story began with this person winning the lottery, then this moment would be the inciting incident for the story, and it would be the reason why the story is taking place. The reason the story is about this person is because they won the lottery, and so the unlikeliness of the setup must be accepted for the story to take place. Conversely, if you were to insert this plot point into the middle of a pre-existing story, and we were to say that after arriving in Lake Town, Bilbo discovered that he had won the Lake Town lottery, then this would make the story less believable due to the incredibly low likelihood that this particular character that we have been following on his unrelated journey also just so happened to win the lottery. This is the same concept I explained in the Rings of Power final autopsy when Galadriel is accidentally discovered on multiple occasions while whilst swimming in the middle of the ocean. Conveniences multiply, and become more severe by an order of magnitude once you start stacking them on top of each other. However, in the case of Bilbo winning the lottery in Lake Town, we might ask what the purpose of this is, narratively speaking. If it means nothing, in that it did not feed into anything else by having the rest of the plot be contingent upon Bilbo having won the lottery, then in my view at least this becomes far less of a problem. A story that repeatedly relies on luck to get its characters out of trouble, however, is a story that has not been written adequately. A story in which lucky things happen that have no impact regarding narrative progression is a story that has maybe been written sloppily, but is by no means as bad as the former. There are many moments of random luck in The Hobbit, but here are a handful of what I consider to be the worst offenders. Radagast's arrival in an unexpected journey saves everyone's lives. Radagast travels from Dol Guldur to locate Gandalf and give him the Morgul Blade. Immediately afterwards, they are attacked by Azog's Warg Riders. Thankfully, Radagast is able to buy the company of Thorin enough time for them to escape down the secret passage into Rivendell. Did Radagast have a reason for being here? Yes, he wanted to warn Gandalf of what he found in Dol Guldur. Could Radagast have been here? Not by any means that are explained in the film, as he had no way of knowing where Gandalf was. So why is this an instance of poor writing? Because not only did the writers teleport Radagast across Middle-earth, but they also placed the company of Thorin in a position where Radagast teleporting across Middle-earth was necessary in order for them to survive. If Radagast had not arrived at precisely this moment, the company of Thorin would have been captured or killed. There is a moment that occurs shortly after this that may appear to be similarly flawed, but I'm going to use it as an example of this kind of thing done right. After fleeing down the secret passage, Elrond arrives with some elves and they fight off the orcs. Wow, holy shit, how convenient, except bear with me, I'm going to explain why this time the writers actually cleaned up after themselves and allowed this moment to function properly. We learn soon afterwards that Elrond had been hunting the orcs for a period of time. This explains why the elves were present. There is a narrative reason why Elrond was able to save the day rather than suddenly elves. Yes, from the perspective of the company of Thorin, some elves just randomly showed up and killed the orcs, thus saving their lives. But once we have the additional information as to why Elrond was there, it ceases to be an instance of blind luck. So to summarize, Elrond appeared at that location justifiably and his actions in fighting the orcs were entirely character driven. Conversely, Radagast arrived at that location unjustifiably and whilst his actions were character driven, his reason for being present was entirely unrelated to the presence of the orcs. 
There are also multiple examples of characters surviving massive scale action sequences, including the Thunder Battle, the Barrel Chase, the Smaug Chase, and the Chariot Chase. The characters do not survive due to their skill. They survive because the film decided that they can't die. These sequences were essentially created so as to be large scale and thrilling, but due to their nature they strain suspension of disbelief. These sequences are so bombastic and ridiculous that much of the tension is alleviated because cause and effect don't seem to apply. We also have very minor moments of luck that are nonetheless crucial to the story. Gandalf is attacked by bandits for no reason, which enables the entire plot of these films. Bolg shows up at exactly the right time when the dwarves are escaping in the barrels. One orc trying to kill Legolas and getting captured while on his own directly leads to Legolas and Tauriel's involvement in the rest of the trilogy. The Arkenstone is incredibly important to the third film, and the only reason it is in play is because Bilbo stumbled across it, which given the size of the treasure hoard is astronomically unlikely. Dane arriving just in time, Alfred accidentally saving Gandalf, the list goes on. <laughs> There are three primary themes that I found to be present within the Hobbit movies. There are definitely more, but to keep this somewhat digestible, I'm going to talk about the big three and to what degree the films succeeded or failed to explore them effectively. The first theme is that of greed. Let's start with the good. Erebor was exceptionally wealthy. Thrall refused to return Thranduil's gems and later went mad from his love of gold. Smaug attacks Erebor because of the dwarves' love of gold, meaning that Smaug is the consequence of their wealth, meaning that the dwarves brought this upon themselves. Thrall fleeing with the Arkenstone also directly leads to it being lost to Smaug, as had he placed it in his pocket he may well have been able to escape with it, meaning that Thrall's sickness-inspired desire to protect the gold at all costs directly leads to the loss of the Arkenstone and the scattering of the dwarves of Erebor. This works because it foreshadows what would happen to Thorin, and it sets up the conflict with Thranduil. It also serves as a far shorter and simpler depiction of the evils of greed that would be explored later, to varying effect. Now onto the less coherent explorations of greed. Nori steals from the elves and he essentially gives no explanation. He's just greedy and that's it. Bilbo is overcome with rage and attacks the creature in the forest to get the ring back, and afterwards is in shock at what he had done. He never mentions this again, and this does not feed into any other plot point in the films. Maybe this isn't greed, strictly speaking, but I thought it was worth a mention. Thorin bargains the gold of Erebor to be released from Lake Town, playing into the greed of both the Master and the people of Lake Town. This doesn't work because the Master is a fundamentally unbelievable person, and the people of Lake Town don't seem to be aware that they will quite certainly receive nothing from this deal. This is also an important plot beat, as it directly leads to the dwarves being able to enter Erebor in time, as well as the destruction of Lake Town. The entirety of Thorin's dragon sickness is symbolic of the perils of greed, however this fails almost entirely, primarily because of its resolution, plus the fact that he voluntarily parts with an immense amount of wealth in the form of the Mithril shirt. The dwarves attempt to defeat Smaug using the gold he covets, which almost works due to Smaug's obsession with treasure, but aside from the coherent symbolism here, the scene doesn't work because of the absurdity required to set it up. The master dies due to his greed, except that no he doesn't, he dies because of bad luck that has nothing to do with his greed. And finally, Alfred also dies due to his greed, but this doesn't work because his behaviour is impossible to take seriously. So overall, the theme of greed is certainly present, but outside of the opening ten minutes or so, the exploration of this theme is incredibly flawed. The second theme I want to touch on is that of home, or a desire to have and protect a home. Many of the characters in the film are motivated by this to varying degrees. The dwarves of course want to reclaim their home, and this serves as the central thrust of the narrative. Bilbo is initially unwilling to leave the comfort of his home, ultimately decides to help, and later comes to understand how the dwarves don't truly have a home, which pays off later in his decision to stay with them. Elrond also tempts Bilbo with the offer of staying in Rivendell, which Bilbo nearly accepts but ultimately refuses. Radagast's home is corrupted, leading to him trying to solve the problem by travelling to Dol Guldur. Thorin is mocked by the Great Goblin for not having a home. And conversely, the antagonists are shown to either not care about their homes, or in Thranduil's case, to care too much. Thranduil is only concerned with protecting his home and nothing beyond his borders. He locks down the Woodland Realm after learning of the potential return of Sauron, 
and the only reason he marches on Erebor is to retrieve his gems. For the most part, the concept of a desire for a home is used in different ways with different characters rather well, with a couple of exceptions. The dwarves show an incredible lack of respect towards the elves' home, which makes it very hard to empathize with their plight. Additionally, the Lake Towners retake Dale after they lose Lake Town, finally reclaiming the city they originally abandoned 150 years earlier. This is presumably only possible after they are paid the gold that was promised to them, and so we have to assume Dane upheld Thorin's deal off screen. The final theme that I will cover is that of bravery. This is predominantly explored via the character of Bilbo, as he is very much the fish out of water in this story, and he is forced through his experiences to change fundamentally as a person and find his courage. He is initially very reluctant to join the dwarves, and until they escape Goblin Town, he was having second thoughts about staying. After that point, however, Bilbo's mind is absolutely made up. He will stay, and he will help them. In the scene with the trolls, Bilbo is forced by Feely and Keeley to rescue the ponies from the trolls, and he fails, although not due to a lack of bravery. He fails due to bad luck, which suggests that Bilbo was brave enough to get the job done, and therefore this makes his arc somewhat less significant. Gandalf also tells Bilbo that true courage is not in knowing when to take a life but when to spare one, which then affects how Bilbo deals with Gollum. However, this is the single example of Bilbo sparing a life, and throughout the course of the trilogy he kills many, many creatures. The goblin that attacks him in Goblin Town accidentally kills itself, so this is not Bilbo's fault. He also kills a wag that skewers itself on his dagger, so again, arguably not his fault. The first proactive kill that Bilbo commits is the orc that was about to execute Thorin. In terms of what we actually see on screen, he later kills three spiders in Mirkwood, kills the weird crab thing on the forest floor, kills an orc during the barrel chase, and another during the Battle of the Five Armies. He also nails about three more with rocks, which I assume doesn't actually kill them. So if we ignore the fact that Gandalf's line about saving lives being more courageous than taking them not really fitting with this story, because the writers wanted Bilbo to be involved in massive battle scenes with innumerable body counts, Bilbo's exploration of and increasing comfort with violence is executed rather well. There are however two kills that I feel were either not warranted or should have been done differently. The first is when he saves Bomber from the spider, so killing the spider is a necessity, however removing the ring so as to taunt the spider is absolutely out of character for him. Additionally, his rage fueled evisceration of the crab thing on the forest floor was absolutely unnecessary. Yes, the ring is corrupting him, and yes, when he snapped out of it he did show remorse and or shock at what he had just done, but firstly, the ring's corruption of Bilbo has nothing to do with any of the plot points within this story, and secondly, neither he nor any other character mentions this ever again. Later, Bilbo risks his integrity by vouching for Thorin. This doesn't work at all because no one in Lake Town knows who he is, so he is risking nothing, meaning that this is not really an instance of Bilbo acting upon his newfound bravery. And finally, with regard to Bilbo, he conceals the Arkenstone from Thorin, gives it to Thranduil and Bard, and then returns to tell Thorin that he had done so. This is the culmination of Bilbo's bravery arc, in that he risks his life in an extremely selfless act with the goal of avoiding all-out war, an act that also necessitated him betraying Thorin. However, it relies almost entirely upon the Dragon Sickness subplot and so easily gets knocked down a peg. In terms of the other characters, Gandalf suggests that seeing Bilbo find his courage also helps him find his, which potentially informs his catastrophically unintelligent decision to enter Dol Guldur alone, knowing it to be a trap, which of course doesn't work at all because it portrays Gandalf as incredibly foolish and reckless. We also have Bard climbing the bell tower to shoot at Smaug, which doesn't work because he knows he cannot kill Smaug unless he has the Black Arrow. We then have Bane running into the burning lake town to deliver the Black Arrow to Bard. This doesn't work because there is no way in hell Tauriel should have let that happen, plus the fact that it relies on everyone forgetting about the Black Arrow until now. We also have Legolas throwing his sword to save Thorin, thereby putting himself at a disadvantage against Bolg. This one works rather well, as it was a payoff to something that was adequately set up previously. And finally, Thorin sacrifices his life to defeat Azog, thereby avenging his grandfather and Feely, and also allowing the Orc army to be defeated. This partly works, however the issues are that Thorin never knew of the deaths of either Thrain or Keeley, as well as the fact that the reason the battle is won is due to the arrival of the Eagles, not Azog's death.
Overall, The Hobbit is just as hit and miss in its exploration of the various themes it contains as it is in pretty much every other department. It is occasionally excellent, but largely contradictory, ill-explained, or nonsensical. So The Hobbit movies had an exceedingly difficult job. The concept of adapting The Hobbit into any number of movies, in principle, seems to be an impossible task. Tolkien's original novel is a children's story, unlike its successor The Lord of the Rings, which is fully fledged high fantasy. Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings trilogy is, from what I have heard, tonally similar to Tolkien's source material. The films are epic on a scale never seen previously and I would argue never matched since. Prior to starting work on the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Peter Jackson actually wanted to adapt The Hobbit first, intending at that point that The Hobbit would be the first film in a trilogy, the second and third encompassing The Lord of the Rings. Because of various shenanigans involving who owns the rights to what, he ended up being asked by Harvey Weinstein, his producer at the time, to press on with his adaptation of The Lord of the Rings. There were rights issues involved which were quite complicated. Primarily because Warner Brothers didn't own all the rights. They were shared between Warner Brothers and MGM, a historical situation I think that goes right back to the 60s actually, when Tolkien originally sold the film rights. Meaning that, had Peter Jackson got his way on day one, then we more than likely would have gotten a Hobbit movie before The Lord of the Rings rather than after it. This likely would have prevented many of the tonal problems present within these movies, as if The Hobbit movie had been released in a world in which The Lord of the Rings trilogy did not exist, then I think it is fair to assume it would have been far more in line with the source material. It could have been a relatively small scale and small stakes fantasy story set within a much larger world. A world that would then be expanded upon in the second and third films. As that is not what happened, let's get back to reality. Given the massive success of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, naturally the studios wanted to have another go with the IP, to adapt more of Tolkien's work into a massive blockbuster. And so they turned their attention to The Hobbit, which Tolkien had written prior to The Lord of the Rings but featured many of the same characters. The Hobbit was adapted previously in a 1977 animated film, and I won't say too much about this version other than that the film is extremely streamlined, barely 80 minutes long, all primary characters are introduced in the opening couple of minutes, the story is laser focused on the quest to retake Erebor, it has some absolutely fantastic music, it maintains a fairy tale vibe, and it is absolutely more coherent and a superior overall experience than the Peter Jackson trilogy. Also, this fabulous motherfucker is Elrond. Yes, yes, of course. Well, first of all, they're not troll make. They must have been stolen. And this eccentric individual is Thranduil. Take them away until they feel inclined to tell the truth, even if they wait a hundred years. Anyway, the producers of the Peter Jackson trilogy really had two options. They can either prioritize making a faithful adaptation of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit, or they can prioritize making an epic prequel trilogy to The Lord of the Rings. Had they fully committed to either of the above, then the end result would have not only been far more coherent as a narrative, but it may also have been able to maintain a particular level of quality. Unfortunately, they decided to try to do both, and they failed at both. The Hobbit novel is a very simple story that could easily have been told in about four hours. Without going too in-depth, Peter Jackson claims that he alone is responsible for The Hobbit ending up as a trilogy, instead of two movies as originally envisioned, stating that he did not want Bilbo's story to feel any less epic in scale compared to The Lord of the Rings. We want The Hobbit to be a, a visual experience that goes several steps beyond Lord of the Rings. That was one of the things that Peter told us very early on. Don't think small. Think big, think wide. The way Peter described it is bigger than any battle that's ever been filmed before. And unfortunately, that statement makes abundantly clear what the problem is. Bilbo's story is inherently less epic in scale compared to The Lord of the Rings. The stakes are far smaller, the scope of the narrative is much narrower. The Lord of the Rings deals with world-ending apocalyptic stakes. Frodo has to travel across the breadth of Middle-earth into Sauron's evil lair to destroy a superweapon. Along the way we have multiple encounters with elves as well as two very distinct human factions. We have the Gandalf Balrog plot thread, Denethor Boromir and Faramir, the Aragorn as Isildur's heir plot, I could go on. My point is that The Lord of the Rings is an extremely rich narrative that is in the truest sense of the word, epic. 
In order to satisfy the apparent need for an epic blockbuster trilogy on the same level as The Lord of the Rings, the story of The Hobbit would need to be heavily altered, and as a result, The Hobbit trilogy feels like it is trying to be two things at once, whilst never actually achieving either. The problem with this trilogy is not that it is missing something. What it needs to be good, if not fantastic, is already there. It is just diluted to the point of being unrecognisable. Peter Jackson's Hobbit trilogy is a story that can absolutely be salvaged in the editing room. And many people have attempted this. A quick Google search brings up multiple fan edits of this trilogy. I checked out three of them. The Bilbo edition, the Maple Films edit, and the M4 book edit. I found the M4 book edit to be the best of these, so I will elaborate a bit as to why. I said at the start of my Unexpected Journey video, I think there is probably a fantastic three hour movie somewhere in this nine hours of butter scraped over too much bread. And I am quite pleased that this statement was almost literally correct. This cut is four hours and five minutes long, and it cut out 51% of the original runtime. There is a huge amount of information on their website, the link will be in the description in case you want to check it out for yourself, but in short, the goal of this edit was to be more faithful to the book, whilst still incorporating some elements added by Peter Jackson. Side plots and side characters are removed, and the tone is more coherent, intentionally starting as upbeat and whimsical, and gradually becoming more serious. Interestingly, this seems to be what the writers had intended for the official release, but this is obviously not what ended up happening. We were originally doing two Hobbit movies, An Unexpected Journey, and part two was there and back again. But when it became three movies, the nature of the content of the movie had changed. The sort of the, the, um, the tone and the, uh, the feeling of that last movie was different. This was a war film. The end chapters are very different tonally. They turn, they change, they take on a darker nature. The M4 book edit is more than simply a recut. They have added and removed things using visual effects as well as made adjustments to the soundtrack. Virtually all problematic scenes have been cut or heavily edited and the story remains entirely functional. The one single ridiculous moment that is plot critical is the method by which Bard defeats Smaug, which is edited here using visual effects. As I covered earlier, the extended cut, as well as the theatrical cut, can be split comfortably into four separate plot threads. The M4 book edit removes three of them entirely and focuses the story on… well, The Hobbit. It also fixes virtually every narrative issue I took with this primary plotline. The only big question mark that remains is how Dane received Thorin's message and then managed to get from the Iron Hills to Erebor in one single day. I cannot think of another film that would drastically improve in quality as a result of cutting more than half of the footage from it. The M4 book edit was the mother of all salvage operations and by and large, it is a pretty incredible success. Dialogue is rejigged and the film is refocused so as to emphasize different things, such as Bilbo's relationship with Thorin. Azog, Bolg, Sauron, Radagast, and Alfred are almost entirely absent. Azog and Bolg simply appear as Orc commanders, whilst Legolas is in the film for a total of one minute, and Tariel is only ever seen in the background, the love triangle of course being completely absent. Characters that were irritating are now often endearing because they don't outstay their welcome. Gandalf and Thorin are no longer occasionally deranged idiots, and Smaug remains intelligent throughout. All references to Bard being the town hero are removed, Thorin's dragon sickness is much more subtle, meaning that he has agency, because whilst he is being irrational and seems deluded, he is not explicitly stated to be the victim of a magic sickness that stops your brain working. Every action he takes can now be attributed directly to him, making him a far more compelling character. Thorin's death scene is even more powerful now because we are able to believe the events that brought him to this conclusion. Keeley's death is also much more sudden and matter of fact, which makes it that much more shocking than it was in the original cut. Azog is reduced to a badass orc commander, and he is definitely more imposing in the M4 edit because we don't have superfluous scenes of him monologuing about how evil he is.
The M4 book edit is, of course, not perfect, and I was going to go through some of the problems that I have with the original film that remain in this cut, but honestly, I would thoroughly recommend seeing it for yourself. The M4 book edit is about as good a version of The Hobbit as is conceivably possible, given the footage they had to work with. If you ever feel like re-watching The Hobbit, I would strongly suggest watching the M4 book edit instead, and again, the link is in the description. These fan edits make clear what the true problems with the Hobbit trilogy are. The filmmakers added a whole load of extra bullshit that did not need to be there, that actively made the films worse, and that could in almost all cases be cut out entirely without affecting the rest of the film. If you have made it this far, you may have noticed that there is the potential for a silver bullet that I have not mentioned yet. One simple remedy that can theoretically excuse many of the faults with this trilogy. I am referring to the concept of the unreliable narrator. As the trilogy opens with old Bilbo writing his book for Frodo, this contextualizes everything that we see as being Bilbo's version of what happened. This would go some way to excusing things like the cartoon physics, the one-dimensional villains, Gandalf's interesting use of magic, and the strange and often inappropriate comedy. This is how Bilbo remembers his adventure, or more specifically, this is how he wants his adventure to be remembered. For scenes in which he was not present, he was simply filling in the gaps, either based on what other people told him, or by making it up. Alfred and the Master are comically evil zero-dimensional selfish clown people, well, Bilbo remembered them like that, and spiced them up a bit to make for an entertaining story. Multiple contradictory explanations for dragon sickness? Well, Bilbo didn't really understand it himself, hence the discrepancy. Legolas having impossible acrobatic skills? Well, Bilbo was so in awe of how skillful the elves were that he exaggerated it. We can even go one step further and suggest that Bilbo is being deliberately inaccurate because he wrote his book to entertain children. This defense is not exactly what I would call airtight, however, as the first line in the film is, My dear Frodo, you asked me once if I had told you everything there was to know about my adventures, and whilst I can honestly say I have told you the truth, I may not have told you all of it. Which implies that everything Bilbo tells in his story, he considers to be true. It is time for you to know what really happened. The story is explicitly stated to be the truth, according to Bilbo, meaning that whilst this does leave some wiggle room, it does not allow for him simply making things up. So if I am going to be entirely consistent with my standards, then I have to concede that, yes, if Bilbo is an unreliable narrator for the entire trilogy, then this excuses many of the problems I have highlighted. It shifts the blame from the writers of the story to the writer in the story. Instead of interpreting this as the writers failing to tell a coherent story, it is in fact one of their characters who is failing to tell a coherent story. The problem with using the unreliable narrator defense, however, is that it does not excuse a story being bad, contradictory, nonsensical, poorly paced, bloated, cringy, and absurd. It merely provides the potential for an in-universe justification as to why that story is all of those things. To put it another way, imagine for a moment that Rings of Power Episode 1 opened with Kate Blanchett as Galadriel sitting down to write a book called The Rings of Power. This would immediately make the unreliable narrator defense applicable to Rings of Power, and whilst the story being contextualized as being entirely from Galadriel's perspective would certainly have explained a few things in that series, it would not have suddenly made Rings of Power a good story. One example of the unreliable narrator flashback being used excellently is in Titanic. The story of Rose's doomed romance with Jack on the Titanic is told as a flashback by Rose 80 years afterwards. There are multiple times throughout the film where the story jumps forward to the present day, and one effect of this is that the audience is constantly aware of the subjectivity of the events they are witnessing. One notable example of this is when we are seeing Jack draw Rose like one of his French girls, the film then amusingly cuts back to Gloria Stewart, explaining how erotic everything was. A joke is made by the fact that this group of treasure hunters and scientists are having to sit here and listen to a 100-year-old woman ramble about how hot it was when she got really, really wet, but it also makes clear to the audience that Rose is being almost needlessly and frustratingly detailed and precise with her story. What we are seeing is very clearly an idealized and very likely exaggerated version of what may well have actually happened to her character on the Titanic. 
This kind of thing could have, and absolutely should have, been done in The Hobbit. Had the films lent into the Bilbo's fairy tale concept, then it would have been far easier to accept some of the more absurd nonsense that the films depict. Had the films been presented in a way similar to the prologue, wherein Bilbo directly narrates the events, then this would have been a far more reasonable defense. There we were, Frodo, surrounded by goblins. This one goblin, the great goblin king, had a chin that looked like my scrotum. And then, from seemingly out of nowhere, Gandalf appeared to rescue us. And so, dear Frodo, the dwarves were swept down the river with the orcs hot on their tail, when suddenly the elves appeared and carved their way through the creatures whilst riding on the dwarves' heads. And we were stopped at every turn by these two disgusting bureaucrats who literally wanted to starve everyone and inject gold into each other's eye sockets. And Frodo, the great elven king Thranduil, Will greatly desired mysterious gems, although no one knew why. And shortly after I escaped Erebor, Thorin squeezed really hard and decided to stop being a cunt. Okay, so maybe they didn't need to literally do that, but my point is that an amount of narration could easily have been utilized, which would both give the films a fairy tale feel, not dissimilar to the book, and would have given a very clear explanation for the inconsistent tone of the film. Which, incidentally, is precisely how Bilbo's adventure is depicted in the 1977 animated version. Regardless, my guess is that this was never even considered as being an option, as the films clearly wanted to live up to the epic scale of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and so watering everything down by having Bilbo speak to the audience as if they are children would not have helped them achieve that goal. The unreliable narrator defense, however, is not a shield against everything. Whilst we can, literally, defend anything we see as being a product of Bilbo's imagination in-universe, this does not mean that it would be acceptable to, for example, insert a scene from The Avengers into the middle of The Hobbit. Yes, Bilbo could just be remembering it wrong. Yes, Bilbo could have an extremely active imagination, and he could be exaggerating in order to entertain Frodo. Plus, we don't know that in-universe, whilst Bilbo was escaping from the goblins, Tony Stark wasn't battling the bug people in a city somewhere else in Middle-earth. This is obviously absurd, and the problem with this would be that it breaks the world if Tony Stark exists in Middle-earth. Therefore, we would not be able to believe Bilbo's narration, as it would be too unreliable. The unreliable narrator is not an excuse for literally anything to happen. There is a difference between acknowledging that some parts of the film may be exaggerated as a result of Bilbo's embellishment, and opening the floodgates to all kinds of insane nonsense. So whilst it is certainly harder to draw a line as to what is acceptable and what is not when dealing with an unreliable narrator, a line has to be drawn nonetheless. With all that said, do I hate the Hobbit trilogy? No, or at least it is nowhere near as bad as Rings of Power. However, I do hate the fact that it squandered what could have been. This was not some guy making a movie for a bit of fun. This was Peter Jackson adapting another book by J.R.R. Tolkien that serves as a prequel trilogy to The Lord of the Rings. And this time around, he had nearly three times the budget to work with. I don't mean to place the blame squarely on Peter Jackson because he was put in an extremely unpleasant scenario, or potentially he put himself in that scenario. Guillermo del Toro was one of our favorite filmmakers and he was very enthusiastic about doing it. And in our mind, he was a director that would do a really interesting version of The Hobbit. I am exploding with the desire of just <laughs> showing everything. It's fun, but it's challenging, but it, and it's, it requires you to to have your stuff together. You know, you have to do your homework every day. I, I really trust that we're in a chain. We began writing with Guillermo and that was wonderful, but unfortunately we had no green light. We literally, the movies weren't green lit. What? However, during that time, Warner Brothers were still funding the pre-production, so Guillermo was able to do a lot of the work that the director would do in that year and a half before you actually start rolling the camera. We had a workshop, we are building marquettes, and actually I think they were even starting to build armor. There was a lot of money being spent, I and mean, yet there was no deal between MGM and Warner Brothers. That's a damn stupid thing to do. It became a question of whether Guillermo waited for the next six month delay or does he move on um, and jump back on board one of the other projects he was developing and that's ultimately what happened around May and June in 2010. <gasps> okay, so what now? I have no fucking idea. At the point that Guillermo left, a substantial amount of money had been spent and a huge amount of work had been done. 
And we talked about it and said, well, do we now find somebody else who would like to make The Hobbit and sort of essentially start that, that journey again? Um, or do we help the studio in a very difficult situation and do I step in and do it? What I thought I had to do at that point was to say, okay, you're the guy that made The Lord of the Rings. Get back into that zone. Get back into that headspace. Either way, the problems with The Hobbit were problems that could have been fixed given enough freedom and time. Many of the problems with these films could be attributed to things that were entirely out of the control of the filmmakers. Studio pressure, actors not doing what they are told, writer strikes, crunch time for visual effects teams, all of these things absolutely suck, both for the people they directly affect as well as for the quality of the finished product. However, just because you may have a perfectly valid reason for making a bad movie, this does not in any way change the fact that you made a bad movie. And whilst I certainly have a lot of sympathy for the filmmakers of the Hobbit trilogy, I do nonetheless feel there is a lot to be learned from its shortcomings. So allow me to conclude by asking a handful of rhetorical questions. Who was The Hobbit made for? Primarily, it was made for Warner Brothers, so they could milk another $3 billion out of Middle Earth. But aside from that, it was quite clearly made for fans of Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. I was the target audience for The Hobbit. All the Tolkien fans, they can rest assured that, that there's a team here that have their heart and soul into creating something very, very special. The Hobbit is a story that a great many people were familiar with prior to the release of the films, and the massive cultural and financial success of the Lord of the Rings trilogy meant that, naturally, the studios wanted another piece of the Middle-earth pie. Most of the time when this happens, the project is often created from the ground up for the sole purpose of making money. When Disney made the Star Wars sequels, they had to come up with their own content to staple onto the original trilogy. When Warner Brothers wanted more Harry Potter content, they had to ask J.K. Rowling to write Fantastic Beasts. When Amazon decided to make Rings of Power, they had to create a fragmented version of Tolkien's work by adhering very loosely to very specific parts of his novels without breaching any of their contracts. With The Hobbit, the book was already written. The book was already good. The groundwork had already been done. They had a free win, a guarantee of financial success, and an extremely solid starting point. Had they faithfully adapted The Hobbit into a single film, however, it very likely would have only made a third of what the trilogy ended up raking in, as of course three times the films theoretically means three times the money, which, call me cynical, I honestly believe to be the most likely explanation for what happened. Does Middle Earth remain intact? Moderately. The worst damage to the world building in this trilogy is inconsistencies such as Gandalf's power level and characters seemingly teleporting to precisely where they need to be at precisely the right time. The unhinged tone does also certainly damage the feel of Middle-earth, as it directly affects how believable the setting is. Much of this can be excused by using the unreliable narrator defense, but as I explored previously, this is not a catch-all. Do the characters remain intact? Quite unfortunately, the answer is no. Elrond, Gollum, Galadriel, and Legolas are virtually undamaged. Saruman suffers from clunky dialogue and characters not responding to him in a reasonable manner. The biggest problems in terms of damaged characters, however, are Gandalf and Sauron. Gandalf's behavior in some scenes is absolutely at odds with his behavior in others, not to mention his presence in The Lord of the Rings, and although I can't say much about Sauron's characterization, I will say that his evil plan is either utter nonsense or was explained extremely poorly, or potentially a little of both. And finally, how does one enjoy these films and what concessions have to be made in order to be entertained by the Hobbit trilogy? The simplest answer is that the audience has to either not notice or not care about the pervasive problems with this trilogy. For many people, I'm sure it is simply a case of turn off brain and absorb images on screen and be reminded of Lord of Rings. Because of the occasionally excellent moments within these films, as well as the fact that it is generally strong in the acting department, it is far easier and more understandable for The Hobbit to succeed on this front than it is for Rings of Power, for example. And so I can completely understand someone liking The Hobbit, regardless of its quality, whereas someone liking Rings of Power will be eternally confusing to me. The Hobbit trilogy is not complex. If you ask questions and search for meaning, you will usually not find a satisfying answer. 
The film often punishes you for paying attention and repeatedly confuses the stakes of each scene, as the characters frequently do not react in accordance with those stakes. However, unlike Rings of Power, The Hobbit is absolutely salvageable, as has been made clear by the multiple fan edits that exist. There is a huge amount of artistry within these films, which is why it is so unfortunate that this was all in service of an end product that was absolutely not deserving. The removal of scenes, plot threads, and characters in their entirety improves the film by discarding things that either do not make sense, damage the characters involved, or are inconsequential to the greater narrative. The fact that plot threads can be deleted in their entirety without affecting the narrative flow of the rest of the film indicates rather blatantly how stapled on these extra subplots were, and if The Hobbit were instead a single three to four hour film with all of the bullshit removed, we would be having a very different conversation. So in conclusion, The Hobbit is schizophrenic. The core of the film, as seen in the M4 book edit, is excellent. The amount of damage done to this core by the additional hours of superfluous content is extremely unfortunate, and as a result, as the title of this series suggests, The Hobbit is not very good. At long last, we have made it. The Hobbit has been taking up a significant amount of my brain power over the last nine months or so, and it feels rather good to have finally emerged on the other side. With Rings of Power included, I have been swimming in Middle Earth for well over a year at this point, and so I have decided that what comes next will not be coverage of The Lord of the Rings. This will no doubt disappoint some of you, but I may well explore those films in future. For now, however, I need to apply my brain to something that is outside of Middle Earth, for my own sanity. I am also almost certain that whatever I cover next is going to be positive, as I don't really want to just make X is bad videos on repeat. The goal of this channel is to explore what works, what doesn't, and why, and so I would like to apply that mentality to something I genuinely believe to be worthy of praise. As for the subject of the next series, stay tuned. Before I sign off, I am going to shamelessly plug a couple of things. We have a growing community on Discord, so if you are not already there and you want to jump in and talk about movies, games, food, books, Warhammer, music, or anything else that is on your mind, please do feel free. The link is in the description. I also have a Patreon set up where you can support me directly in the creation of these videos. They do take rather a long time to create, so any support is much appreciated. And finally, I do live streams usually every other Friday evening at 8pm UK time, so if you fancy watching me fail at video games, I invite you to watch, drink, and be merry. And if you miss the streams or want to catch up on some older ones, all of the VODs are available on the second channel. Again, the link is in the description. Thank you so much for seeing this Goliath of a video through to the end, as well as your continued support. It honestly means everything to me. I hope you have enjoyed the series, and I will see you in my next video.